Good evening. Welcome to the May 8th, 2017 school committee meeting. Um, we're going to start with a public hearing on school choice. Then I'll open up the floor to public comment if anybody is here from the public who wants to address the committee on an issue not on the agenda. We have a quick agenda, um, consent agenda with uh, field trips, a donation, and some minutes. We're then going to be spending the bulk of our meeting discussing communication and the efforts that have been made over the last year or so to improve and enhance communication at the district level. And then we're going to talk about um, the superintendent's annual evaluation process. And then we have a little bit of information and correspondence at the end. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, for a motion on uh, school choice. Move pursuant to uh, to the provisions of General Law 76 and 12B that the School Committee of Reading, following a public hearing, hereby withdraws from its obligation to enroll non-resident students to, in the Reading Public Schools during the 2017-2018 school year for the following reason: general district enrollment. Is there a second? Um, I will open it up to anyone who is here to address um, school choice. Seeing no comments from the public, um, I believe we have a question from the committee. Should I close the hearing and then take questions, or is that within the hearing? No, no, it's within the hearing. Right. Mr. Bob, MVP? Yeah, just uh, someone coming into the process. Everybody else on the committee has been through this before except me. Dr. Yardy, could you give us just a really quick explanation of the, the general enrollment uh, reason and where that comes from, why we've recommended not participating in this in the past? Under the law, um, a school district may choose to uh, open school choice to other communities um, for a particular level, um, whether it be elementary, middle, or high school, or the entire district itself. Uh, it's primarily for this general re for this reason of general school room it's based on class size and we just do not have the, the space or the capacity right now nor the we're under the budgetary constraints to be able to uh, take on any additional enrollment in our school district okay can I ask some follow-up questions sure. uh, so the capacity and cost question uh, the as I understand it, any student that came into Reading under this program would receive, is it 5000 if they're not in an IEP? Would that be the cap? That is correct. And do we spend more than 5000 per student across our district on average, uh, roughly? <coughs> well, our per pupil expenditure is, I believe, about 12500 Right. So, so this would represent $5,000 at the most per student, assuming they're not on an that, IEP? That would, be the, that would be what we would get from the state. That is correct. Okay. And then... Have we ever been a part of the? We have not. Okay. And then just, just for benchmarking, I'd, I'd looked at a, a few districts that we have these 11 districts that are our comparators, and I just want to confirm my understanding that um, eight send students but without receiving, and it costs them, you know, on average 5 to 10K each. And do we send students out to other districts? We have, I believe, two students that... Uh, participate in school choice. Um, I believe they. it's both for the Greenfield Academy, which is an online option <coughs> uh, for school choice. It's the only online option um, in the Commonwealth, and so that counts as a school choice. So I believe we have two students. And do we pay for that? It comes out of the state assessment. So we do, we do pay for that? So you see, them? yes. So okay. we, we receive a reduction in our, I guess you could say it's our Chapter 70 funding. Okay, and so we send a few students out. We don't receive any students, and the, the vote tonight is about not receiving any students. Not that, is, that students. is correct. Okay. Uh, nothing further. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions from the committee? No? Are we ready for a vote? All those in favor? <coughs> it is 6 0. zero. I'll now ask if there's public comment. So, this is um, anyone who wants to address the committee on an item not on the agenda. Mr. Berman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Barry Berman, 54 Longview Road. I want to just make it clear here that um, my comments tonight are being made as a citizen and a parent and not as a member of the Board of Selectmen. 
um, although sometimes those kind of bleed into each other, um, that's not going to be the fact tonight. Um, I'm, a, I'm a parent of a high school student um, uh, who's struggling to kind of figure his way as, as we are. And um, I was really taken uh, aback and, and kind of um, really in awe of a letter that was written, I'm sure most of you have seen it, um, by a recent Reading Memorial High School grad, um, Julia Donahue talking about some of the issues that uh, high school students here in Reading, and probably everywhere, are facing dealing on mental health issues, whether it's kind of the stresses of trying to get into college or just, you know, just dealing. Um, and what made it really kind of um, striking to me, it's, it, it's not, it wasn't really a high level discussion, although it was incredibly well written and well thought out. This was, this was written as sort of like a, a reporter embedded in war. I mean, this is someone who had boots on the ground in the high school, knowing friends, dealing, uh, you know, with folks that she knows um, and, and real life incidents. And it just seems to me as I read that, um, sort of feeling really sad that, you know, we spend so much time and so much energy and so much money trying to get the best education we can for our kids that I think sometimes we, we maybe miss the mark in that, you know, we're not educating the entire child. Um, and, and I know health and wellness has come up many, many times here um, at the board. Um, and um, I know that you, you guys, it, 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 you know, it's top of mind. Um, but yet it seems like we have so many things to do. And, and just sort of following up the social media comments sort of after that post, there was so many thoughtful contributions by members of the community dealing, well, how do you, how do you deal with someone, you know, not committing suicide in high school, and, and one, one person stated data that, well, if we just ha make really good readers in second and third grade, the stress is then relief and there's less of a chance of doing that. So there's so many different kinds of strategies and so many different kinds of observations that were made, some of which might cost money and some of them don't. Um, and, and so I'll put my selectman on hat for 10 seconds. Um, you know, we're going to be going through another debate in terms of what are the priorities here in town. Um, what are we going to spend on schools? What are the things that we think are important? You know, when we did the, when we did the last override, um, there were so many people that said, prioritize classrooms, teachers, and everything else really doesn't matter. We really have to put teachers in. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that, you know, obviously on its face makes sense. You want to prioritize, you know, classroom. But again, we need to be thinking about educating the entire student. Um, and, and so I encourage you as a parent um, that as you go through your priorities, and figuring out kind of what are the things that we're going to bring forward, what are the things that we're going to add, what are the things that are absolutely, um, you know, non-negotiable. I would think that the health and wellness of the students of Reading, not just on the high school level, but the entire district, are really tantamount. I don't really care, frankly, whether or not this district offers um, AP physics or AP French or, you know, honors, you know, Latin. But what I really care about is, you know, are we taking care of our kids? That, to me, is the most important thing. So um, as you deliberate and as you come up with the things that you think are important to kind of move the community forward, I would hope that you don't succumb to the pressures of, well, we just have to deal with classroom teachers. We really have to deal with this. And I know that you left a lot of the stuff in the budget, but there may be other things um, that were especially laid out in this young woman's letter that I think you should take a look at. And I know I, as a parent and as a voter, I would be supportive of those kinds of things. So just, uh, you know, as one person, not a selectman, I just want to bring that to, to your attention and to know that I think that, that a lot of other people are thinking that too. So I know we're dealing with the politics of scarcity, but you know, when it comes to the health and wellness of our children, that that's something that you, know, you, you cannot be abundant enough on. So I just want to lay that out there and I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Behrman. Um, <clears throat> I think we'll all take that to heart. I did personally read the letter and was as <coughs> moved as you were by it. Um, and it's an issue that's certainly very close to my heart. So thank you. thank you for sharing that with us. Any other public comment? Seeing none. Before we go on to the consent agenda, I would like to do two quick things. One is to remind the community that this is being um, broadcast live on RCTV. And I'm going to take a point of privilege as chair to take a moment. Um, to congratulate our senior, Alex, who's graduating three weeks? Yeah. Three weeks. Are you ready? <laughs> um, I must say, Alex 
For the past two years, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you. You are so intelligent, so articulate, and there have been times when we've had to make very difficult decisions as a committee, and you've brought the student voice to us, even when I think that was sometimes hard, when there was a decision on the table that was very unpopular, and you came and said, I'm talking to my friends, and this is, um, I'm thinking particularly of the Latin program. You spoke eloquently in defense of that program, and it had a result in the outcome. You should be very proud of that. Um, so I think the entire committee wishes you the best of luck at Holy Cross. Uh, and boy, you're really going to be missed. So, to Alex. This is from the school. Thank you. I really do wish you the best of luck. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, moving on to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion? Is there anything that anyone would like to? Yes, Mr. Boabin. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt. No, to, I, I, would, I would motion to remove the um, Czech Republic field trip from the consent agenda. Okay. Can we, do we discuss that now or no? After or second. After yeah. we. Okay. Well, I'll second for. You don't actually don't need a second on oh, that. Oh, for that. Any okay. committee member can oh. move any remove anything from the consent agenda. Period. Like okay. any one of us can right. do that. Sorry. Any other ones? Those in favor of the motion? Oh, I think you have to move to approve the consent I'll move agenda. I'll move to approve the consent agenda as amended. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? 6 0. <coughs> uh, Mr. Bobbin, can you uh, address that item? Yeah, sure. So I just had some questions. Give, given that this is international travel, and I, I recognize from the materials that there's apparently a deadline at the end of May, so it's somewhat time sensitive if, if that's the deadline we're trying to meet. Um, I just want to make sure that we have information that's adequate on the ratio of students to teachers, which is a 40 plus, and I know the enrollment may be a year away, but, and we have to actually two years. I believe this is a 2019. Two, so we may not be, but I'm just I want to make sh sure that we understand in approving this the, that we have the appropriate ratio of s teachers to students is consistent with what other districts do when they do international. Your training. policy is 10 to one. So if I want to just know that we're within that yes. guidance. I met with uh, Dr. Ryan uh, the, the other day about this field trip, mm -hmm. and he's run many of these field trips. In fact, he ran this field trip, I believe, four years ago, um, and he is very well aware of the ratio. Okay. And the second question is number 16. It says, has the school determined that the, faculty, the facility has adequate insurance? And I'm not the expert on this committee on insurance, but I just <coughs> want to make sure, again, it just says TBD in the response, and I want to make sure. Yeah, yeah that's, sure that's, that's that the be travel agent explorer. Okay. okay, so yes, you we've can personally say that we'll have the appropriate insurance. In we've used Explorica in the past, yes. And that will have the insurance yes. that we need? Okay. Last questions are on the next page, just the, med that includes medical and trip insurance, right? So my other question is medical insurance. Yes. So sure that. And is medical preclearance required? No. I just want to make sure that we don't have any you know, unexpected you know, students. So we, we, I, I've been on one of these trips before as a chaperone for a different school district. We had a student who got sick immediately after landing and was literally in the hospital for two weeks, and I was one of the people who took turns with, um, with a teacher um, sitting by the bedside of a student. That's how we spent the duration of the trip, which was no fun for anybody. So I just want to make sure if there are any things like food allergies or anything like that, that those are going to be addressed in a medical preclearance process with a nurse or something. Those are all like part that. of our protocol that we do for any field trip, not just international field sure. trips. So I just want to make sure that, that the committee is aware of those outstanding items as are addressed before we you know, sign students up to actually go. Otherwise, if, if those are going to be addressed, I can approve this. Thanks. Sure. Anything else? Yes. Just, I, I guess I would appreciate all the questions and would just like to say that I had – Two of my sons went on two different trips. One, the last one that he, uh, that Dr. Ryan ran, and then the other one went on an earlier trip prior to that. And um, they were amazing trips, as, as they always are. So, and I think that you know, making sure that we have a, we have a good policy, and we follow the policy, is an important part of making sure that they're amazing trips. So, um, excited that we'll be able to offer this again for st for students. Dr. I just wanted to second that. My son also went on this trip, and it's learning that's different from what you can do in the classroom, both community building with the people that go and the places and cultures that they experience. Um, but it is very important that the safety is kept in mind and that we never get so comfortable that we don't pay attention to that safety. 
Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Knight. I think we've asked this question before, but I just think it's appropriate to ask it. I think actually Dr. Doxer asked, asked it a while back. Um, considering customs are different in, in each country and we have restrictions in alcohol use, I'm just wondering what is the policy that we put in place in terms of if they went to Czechoslovakia and it's okay to drink at the age of 18? No, this is a school department field trip, and <coughs> so all rules apply. Um, in the, as according to the student handbook. Yeah, and I thought so, but I just wanted to bring it up. That's a good point. Okay. Anything else from the committee? Okay, I'm going to need a motion to approve that field trip. Yeah, motion to approve the field trip to the Czech Republic and Poland as described in the school committee packet. Second. Second. All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you for those questions. Um, that is it for the consent agenda. Our agenda requires reports next, but I think I'm going to postpone that. We have some visitors tonight that yes, I'm do. very excited to hear from, and both of them have to be up very early in the morning. So uh, I want to get them kind of going <coughs> so that they can get out as, as quickly as possible. So I think we have Ms. Shanklin and Ms. Leonard here. We actually have oh, several even people more. here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as you know, uh, we've done a lot of work uh, with communication in terms of our website and uh, other areas uh, over the last year. Uh, actually, over the last couple of years, this has been one of the focus areas of our district improvement plan. So this evening, we thought we would give you an update on uh, the type of progress that we've made. Uh, I have uh, three of our tech integration specialists here. Uh, Mick Powers from Parker, Kathy Santilli, who represents the elementary, Chuck Strout from the high school. Masha Grant would have been here, um, but she had a little uh, dental work done this afternoon, so she wouldn't have been able to speak. So um, that went <laughs> So she, she, we told her to stay home. And then, uh, we, then we're gonna look at it from a school perspective. So uh, Mrs. Leonard, uh, principal at Barrows, and Mrs. Shanklin from the principal at Parker uh, volunteered to talk about uh, the types of things that are going on in their schools uh, to give you a snapshot of uh, what it looks like in the school. So what we're going to take a look at tonight, um, I'm going to do a little bit of an overview uh, and talk about district level and then uh, our tech integration specialists are going to talk about the shift to the cloud services that we've done over the last year and in particular the PLUS portal uh, which is our main parent teacher student communication tool now which is much different than what we had in the past. Um, and then our two principals will talk about what it looks like um, at the uh, building level, and then we'll talk a little bit at the end about future direction. Um, so just an overview of the changes that have happened. If you remember in October of 2015, uh, most of you were on the committee when we had a communication audit done by the National School Public Relations Association. Uh, we've been using that audit to help improve some of the things that we've been <coughs> able to uh, do from a capacity standpoint. Um, so this year as part of that, those changes, uh, we transitioned to an integrated cloud-based student information management system, which included a portal and website system, and that's called Redeker. We did have a Redeker system in the past, um, but what we had in the past was the old server-based Redeker system, and in addition, we had some third-party solutions that, that connected to um, Redeker. So, for example, we had Edline, which was our web solution and our teacher um, page piece. Um, we had GradeQuick, which was our gradebook program. We had um, the elementary gradebook program, AP Web. Uh, the problem with all of these pieces is that they were not part of an integrated solution. So, what was happening over time is that at one point when we were, when we first were purchased, we purchased these tools, they were integrated with Redeker, and then over time, because they were third party, they didn't necessarily make the changes to stay integrated with Redeker, and we were seeing more and more difficulty at the building level and at the district level, and we were also, as, I, as was part of the audit, we did hear a lot of complaints from parents about Edline um, and the uh, awkwardness and complexity of Edline. So we made this change to the, to the Redeker cloud-based solution because it was an integrated approach and everything is now um, a seamless solution. 
What we've also been doing over the last few years is we've included social media more and more in our uh, school activities. Uh, each of our schools use social media, whether it be blogs, Twitter, Facebook, to communicate either day, daily information or uh, more weekly information. Many of our schools also have enhanced newsletters, both for parents and for staff. Um, we also have district communication tools that, that mirror that. Um, and also what we've seen at the district level over the last couple of years is we've increased our outreach and communication, not only through social media, but weekly office hours, weekly updates, and our weekly newsletter. Um, so that's an overview of the types of changes that have been going on over the last couple of years. So in terms of the district communication, uh, the website itself, uh, which is part of the, the new uh, Redeker uh, product, um, as of the end of April, we've had over 360 visits to the website, which is remarkable considering it's not, it's not even been a year that we've had it up and running. Um, that includes all of our websites, so not just the district website, but all of the school-based websites as well. Um, we have a new weekly newsletter, Journey is for the Staff, Pathways is for the Community. Um, those are sent out on Sundays. Um, we also have a blog uh, which uh, mirrors the, the newsletter but also lists the office hours and any other significant events that are going on. We do have Twitter and Facebook that are integrated with the blog, so when something is put on the blog, it immediately gets sent out through Twitter and Facebook as well. Um, and there are also weekly email updates from Linda. I believe it's every Thursday. She sends the RPS uh, happenings, um, which gives you a list of all the different activities that are going on, um, as well as any other updates from the community uh, that people have asked us to send out. And then um, something that we put in place in November uh, is weekly superintendent office hours. Uh, to date, I've had 49 office hour sessions in all eight schools. We average two to three a week. Um, we try now, based on feedback, to do a night and a Saturday, as well as one uh, either in the morning or the afternoon during drop-off or pickup time. Uh, we've had over 100 visitors to those office hours, particularly during budget season. Um, and Mrs. Dow joined me on a few of those. We did have uh, a, a lot of dialogue about budget, which I think did help uh, with the community in, um, in terms of understanding what our budget was about. and. You know, certainly we encourage people to come to those to, to have those conversations. And I've been getting a steady stream of, of people to, to, the, to the office hours, which is, which is great. And sometimes it's a five-minute conversation. Sometimes it's about a 25-minute conversation, depending on the topic. But I think they've been very valuable. Just to have that availability for the community has been, has been very valuable. Um, some other examples of district communication outreach, and, and this is something that I know uh, Mrs. Wilson has worked very hard with the CPAC um, in you know, putting the CPAC back in place and over the last couple of years and has done a great job uh, using the CPAC as, as one of those tools, particularly for um, parents with students with special needs. Um, you notice that it, over the last few months, we've the changes in the school committee packet where we've included the correspondence so that the community can, can get more information. Um, our schools have newsletters and social media. Uh, the budget process, which has been the most comprehensive in the eight years I've been here in terms of the um, questions that were answered, thanks to the work that Mrs. Dowd did in gathering that information and getting it out there. Um, and then on our website, there is, on each of the pages, there's something called Contact Us, and which then goes to a person either at the school or at the district level. And for the district one, um, we've had over 120 submissions since August. And it, it gives an opportunity for someone, if they have a question, to ask the question, um, and then they get an email back uh, with the answer. So these are ways that we're trying to improve outreach. We're trying to uh, increase communication so that people know we are here. Um, and you know, if, once we get the answer, we're, we're able to contact them. The Pathways uh, blog, uh, in terms of the analytics, you can see that we started the blog at the end of 2013, and every year it has been growing in terms of visits. Uh, this past year we were at 40,799. This year, um, 
being May, it's it's at ten thousand, but that you know I'm sure that's going to increase as as time goes on. Um, but you can see that more and more people are using our Pathways blog to get information as well. So now I'm going to turn it over. Um, I believe it's going to be Meg first, and I'm going to give you the clicker, Meg. And Meg's going to talk about the cloud services and the benefits, and show you some of the examples. Dr. Doherty, before you get started, could we ask questions on that section before moving to the next sure. section? It's just so that the presentation doesn't get too unwieldy. Is that sure. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Blocking. Yeah, just two quick questions about, if you could back up um, to the first slide, that question on the first slide, and then the last two. Oh, sorry, next, <laughs> next one, sorry. First subset, there we go. So this audit report, is that a written document, the October 15? I wasn't it here is. at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that available on the <coughs> web page somewhere? Um, I'll have to check to see if we move, put it onto the new web page, but it is in, <coughs> it's in the school, one of the school committee packets That's from that time frame. Could we just put something in the minutes of a link to it or guidance if people want to see what that is and get up to speed on this initiative? Uh, probably the packet's not the best place to put it. I can put the audit Some, on the website. Just somewhere for people to get yep. it if they're interested. Um, next, two more slides forward, please. So this one, let me just look at it, because this wasn't in the packet. Let me see if they have anything on this. And then do we have any connections with, like, Arcasa or any of the other, like, support groups to these? Those are, on, like those are on the website. Okay, so there are other groups that, that support our students that we would want to have access to through this page if that's easy to do, if they have their own page and maybe a link or something. It's already on our website. Terrific. Yeah. Awesome. And then next next slide. Last question, promise for this. Um, so the number of views, do we have per page stats so that we know, for instance, which where people are looking to try to get a sense of what content seems to be most interesting to people and making that as accessible as possible? Or were there not yeah, the, anal the analytic shows which blog posts got the most hits. So if people are always going to certain sections and never going to other sections, that might give us some guidance about what what people want to see or what they're using. But this is just point. the blog. This right? is just a blog. blog. This no, is not the that. website. No, I understand that. But the, the website, or this, this got me thinking. This is the number of blog views. And it got me thinking, well, for all the pages that you're putting time into designing and building, which are the ones that people are under maybe underutilizing or using all the time. I'm just curious if we look at those stats at all. I don't I'm not sure that, that on the website, are we able to do? By school, um, yep. We just started looking at that, to be honest with you. So um, I'm sure the breakdown is there. Um, I was just looking at the outliers. If there's something that like nobody's ever looking at and we're yes, putting a lot of time into that, that's a good feedback loop to streamline our what we're putting there, right? So we don't I, waste our effort. Right, I just want to clarify, this is not the website. Oh, I appreciate that. It's okay. the blog, but it just got me thinking, you've got numbers about people clicking through and it makes me wonder whether we have other numbers about all every, you put all this great effort into this and we hear more about that I just want to make sure people are actually using it and whether we're looking at that just for the outliers yes. really high really low yes thanks yes. Dr. Doxa um, just a couple of things one I wanted to give a shout out um, the CPAC first of all the um, the pages that are being done are another an additional responsibility of our administration um, so I just wanted to give a shout out for that, getting that done. I'm looking at Carolyn Wilson because I know how hard you've worked to try to get that information out there. And then I'm going to shift my gaze over here because I just wanted to give a shout out to Alicia Williams, who is, um, has been working really hard on getting the CPAC information out there and has amazing links and has been posting events on that that I know have been drawing people into the CPAC and I think I know it takes a lot of work to do that as well as the um, blogs because I'm doing that now with my work so I know the hours that people put into these um, and I really appreciate that and I personally um, really enjoy the pathways and the journey both because they give me insight into what's happening in the schools but also the educational philosophy and the changes that are going on and the thinking about education and the debates that are going on, how to best do things. It sort of personifies how there is not necessarily one best way to address all the needs of our students. And so I'm really appreciative that those articles are there for 
to be a catalyst for thought, but also that our our staff and our administration, it gives us a window into the things they're thinking about. So I just wanted to say that. Anything else from the committee? I had two quick things. Mm -hmm. um, one is I've been really glad that you highlighted office hours. I think it has tremendous value for two reasons. One is obviously you're connecting with people and answering questions, and that's helpful. But I think even for people who never go to office hours, it's really good to know you can. It's really nice just to know that that accessibility, that open door is there. So I'm glad you highlighted it. I think it's been a huge success. Um, and I also wanted to talk about, you talked about the transition to the cloud-based. My memory, I'm almost loath to bring this up, but my memory is that that was cost neutral. Um, it actually was saving, it was a savings. Yeah, which yeah. I just think we should highlight Which as well. I think is in one of the slides coming up, right? Yes. It is a cost savings. Yeah, I just, that, <laughs> but that's a great point. That's a, it is a great yep. point. It's astonishing, <laughs> if I do say so myself. Oh, Mrs. Webb. Just maybe this is leading into the next part, but um, so the Ver I don't know whether we're doing Verizon here at the school, but the Verizon service is, is I assume, when the kids are in the school, they're on Wi-Fi. I'm just wondering if we're at all impacted here by the lack of coverage of Verizon, because Verizon does not have towers in Reading. And it's pitiful, but we're not in any way impacted by that as we shift to cloud-based because it's all no. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. I actually have another question, um, and I don't know if this will be covered later. So one of the um, audiences that I'm really interested in reaching is our alumni, and there are people. These are people who are on and connected to our website and getting outreach from our website until their kids graduate. And I was just wondering if there's anything um, being built into the system that there might be a way that they can continue getting this outreach once their kids graduate. And I know that um, I learned that alumni can sign up to still get like the pathways, right, they can go on and connect. So that's not through Redeker. So the only way that can happen, and it, it is, everything comes at a manpower cost. Um, they would have to, we'd have to keep them in our ConnectEd database. It's the only way we could do it. If they want to. If they want to do it. Just so that would mean sending out a message, asking if they'd want to be a part of it, collecting all of that information, and then putting their contact information and connect it. And is that an intensive, uh, it takes a lot of time to do that? It, it takes time. It takes time. And then you have to manage the data. Yeah, you have to manage it. Keep you own mm -hmm. it forever. Right, it isn't a one-time setup. Thing. Yeah. It's an ongoing management of it. Yeah, it'd be, an annual, it'd be an annual thing that we would have to do. Yeah. So, but the blog is separate, so people can write now. The blog's on, yeah, the blog. Just the blog, you can just go. Yeah, you can go on the Reading Public School right, website. It's not like the, we get an email now to say the blog is out. Blog. Yeah, right. yeah. But you just wouldn't, you no longer, once you're an alumni, you don't get the emails that say, oh, by the way, I updated the blog. Yeah, right now, they get, the, the, <laughs> the Connect Ed is sent out every Sunday uh, for the school community and anyone else that's on the, um, the contact list saying that we've updated the blog. So, so they can sign up for the blog and get, like, follow they don't something? Need, they could sign up for the blog and get a notification when there's a new blog post, yeah. Okay, and that doesn't take the extra bandwidth. They can just go on and follow it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Cause but it, we wouldn't, I mean, it, it would be pretty labor intensive to keep an alumni database with what we're trying to do. Anything else from the committee? Thank you, Dr. Doherty, and thank you for your patience. Okay. And just two quick questions. <clears throat> As John was saying, um, one of the things that prompted this was um, response from parents. They um, didn't feel that the current um, program that we were using really gave them enough information, and it wasn't as transparent as they had wanted it to be. So we made the shift, and um, some of the benefits that came from the shift was um, Redeker is now hosting our data. Prior to um, us switching to the cloud services, we were responsible for the updates in the data um, and the programs and also um, hosting the data and doing the backups. So that shift has um, freed up a lot of our server space and it has also uh, made the transition for the updates to be a lot smoother. Um, 
kind of a lot less, um, a lot less problematic than they used to be. Another thing that it does was uh, streamline our SIF, which is our oh, state okay. reporting process. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier, and it's actually a direct link that goes um, right to it. And Redeker is, is involved in that, and they help us out with that a lot. And that, that's a huge uh, plus. Um, the users have remote access capabilities, and that's basically um, the tech integrators as well as the administrators. In September, when this was rolled out, um, parents were trying to get on, and there was a lot of questions and a lot of help and tech support that we needed to provide to them. And we were then able to do it because we could access it from home. So we could do it on weekends, we could do it mm -hmm. at night, and we could be more responsive to them, which, good and bad, but it worked <laughs> out for right. them. Um, with the shift to the cloud services, we have the ability to um, access all the modules um, that Redditor offers. Um, prior to this, we, it was a la carte pricing. So now we have um, the grade book, we have the plus portals, we have um, the actual database itself. So it's all connected, it's all integrated, and it works very, very smoothly. Much more cost effective, which again, the bottom line, but really is um, Kathy's going to talk about the website and the portal. Okay, um, so I want to talk about the website it's, and the portal. That I uh, just wanted just to let you know, uh, talk about the difference between a website and the, and the portal. Um, the website is designed to communicate general school information, so anybody can log into the Reddit, Reading Public Schools website without having to uh, not log in. Just go to the website and it's there. A portal is uh, a little more specific to students and classroom work that requires a login. So. There's a lot, lot more private information that would be on a portal that you do not want you know, everybody to, to access. So that's why, uh, that's the difference between the two. So once we knew Redeker was going to be our host, um, we decided that there were certain things that we wanted our website to, to, um, to have certain key elements. The first thing was brand strategy. Um, we wanted to be able to con con communicate our district's vision and goals in a positive way. We wanted it to show our vision so that what does our district represent, um, let it promote the services that we provide, and show a positive image to connect with community. Uh, we also wanted it to have a chance to celebrate and to raise awareness of academic, um, athletic, and artistic excellence across the school. Mm -hmm. Consistency, we felt it was very important to have a website that was consistent from school to school. Every school had a chance to change, to, to pick their colors, and they also had a chance to pick their logo. But when you, when you go to the website, you will see that there's very consist, a lot of consistency in the layout. You, you can go from one to the other and, and know exactly where you are on each one. Um, the responsive website, a responsive website basically will adapt to any, a web page that will adapt to any, um, any device, any screen size, any, um, any browser, the browser, and regardless of what browser you're using. So it will adjust regardless of, of, of what you're using, so that, that you'll be able to see everything. And analytics, we also felt that it was very important uh, that we able, were able to see the data for our website. So there's, as, as Dr. Doherty had mentioned, there are over 363,000 visits to the site since, since August 2016. So, and again, we will, we will pay, we will look at that again in the future and, and see if we, if, how it drills down you know, further. So the next thing we're gonna do is take a look at the website. So this is the Reading Public Schools website. And you'll see, in this website, there's a place for images that will show different events and activities that are happening in the district. There's a place for news, going down underneath. We'll continue down, we'll go over from left to right. And then at the bottom, there's a box. It's an FAQ box that every website has. It's divided into tabs of parents, students, community, and staff, and basically they're links to, um, you know, quick links to, to information that we feel is important that people would want to access. So 
you could go to the lunch count, um, a teacher could go to, uh, to find how to get to um, um, ASOP to a report an absence. There's all different, and every school has pretty much the same, but there's, there, there, are, uh, there are differences between the two. So moving back up to the top, to the right, you'll see there's a calendar. Every page has, every web page has a calendar. And there's also a place for social media. And at the top, as we were talking about different pages and activities, there's a menu bar with drop downs that will take you to the <coughs> different areas. There's the school committee, different departments in the district, district information, news, and community. Now the other thing that's that's nice about the website is that you can get to any school from the website by just by clicking our school. And so we'll take a look at the, the Eaton School here. And you'll notice that the navigation, the layout is pretty much the same as you saw on, on the main page. The drop downs on the top menu are, will be different. Obviously we have um, other things that we need to, uh, to show. But uh, an about us, uh, something about students, uh, parents, the PTO pages, the PTOs host their own pages, um, news, and <coughs> also the calendar. But you'll also see on the calendar on the right hand side as well. And if you need to see all events, you can just there's a little link you would click for all events, you get and you would get a main, a major calendar. Um, the other thing about the oh scroll down again, Bob, you also see that FAQ box again, listing all the uh, links to different things that people can uh, can access. And scrolling up to the top, <coughs> we can connect to the portals right from the website. So if a parent wants to connect to a portal, they would click the portal link and then they would, they would use their uh, username and password to connect to um, the portal. I'm going to go to the next one. Do you want to go? Oh yeah, we're going go to the web, we're going to go to a portal. So we're going to log into a portal. what you were seeing was the, the administrator page. So we can access all of the schools and access all the uh, parent information and student information and teacher information as well. So if people forget their passwords, we're able to um, take care of that for them. <coughs> so again, the portals require a login. It's a you cannot access anything in the portal without being able to, without logging in. So we're going to take a look at a teacher page. What a teacher will see when she logs into her um, portal, and then Meg will show you what the uh, apparent view will be. logs into her portal, this is what she sees. She has a, a, a menu bar at the top that will show her, um, give her links to places that she can go, her grade books. She can see school announcements. She can see emails that are sent to her, and she can also send emails from her portal to parents and other, other people in the district. Um, scrolling down um, to the bottom there, you'll see that she can also have view the calendar any notifications and alerts that are sent to her, school announcements that are sent, and also any links and files or um, that, can, that are sent to them as well. At the top, um, excuse me, they can, a teacher will then log into their um, summary page. So every teacher will create a summary page where she has a little, uh, it's a welcome to our class and so forth. And this is, they can change this and it can add a little welcome message and images. But scrolling down, you can also see that she has, there's a place, if she were, if in elementary they were going to assign homework, they could do it there. They could actually uh, insert quizzes. But for first grade, uh, this teacher is using it to uh, post links and files so that parents can access them, um, different uh, math and ELA and reading. Activities. Can they? Can that be customized? They the, or are those preset categories? 
Those and are preset categories. What about on the first page? The, the first page you were on down the bottom where there were different like notifications or email. Is that, I'm just wondering if any of those, if the teachers can customize the look of the, their home page to put the things in the point. They can customize that, that area where you put the image, you can put a little a blur oh, above okay. the classroom. As of now, it's not, uh, this is a work in progress right, we're still for Redeker, in, so I'm, my yeah. guess is that that will change uh -huh. at some point, but at yeah. this point now, it's right, pretty These standard are, right. and mm -hmm. cookie cutter um, yeah. as far as what you get. So yes, I think there there were plans for them to do mm -hmm. It'll look a little different like from the parent view as well. Okay. Okay, so another, another nice thing about the portals for the teachers, uh, a couple of key things that have happened this year with the portals is that teachers are now able to access their gradebook where they can enter uh, lunch count and attendance. And that has really streamlined the process from the, the classroom to the office. Uh, it's helping the office staff really um, um, streamline what the, the, the process of getting the lunch count and the attendance into the system. So that's been a big bonus. Another thing has been the, uh, the grade book entry for report cards. As Dr. Doherty had mentioned, we used uh, AP Web in the past to um, enter our grades. It was a little, a little clunky, and now, now that we have a, you know, part of the Redeker suite, they are now able to enter their, um, their report card information directly through the portal and the, the grade books that are attached to the portal. And it's been pretty well received. And finally, one nice thing about um, there's many other features to these uh, these portals uh, is the ability to see report cards. So teachers need to refer their grades from, um, so far we've only done one one term, but uh, they'll be able to see all the report cards from the students. So they, it saves time in, in printing and from printing them out, and it also will allow them to, uh, to view if they need to see them. So as I said, there's, there's a lot more, it would be like two hours worth of uh, information. So we're just kind of streamlining to give you, you know, and that's it for the uh, portal. And now Meg's going to show you um, what, a, what a parent would see when they log in. Um, some of the enhancements of the, um, the parent portal um, is giving this, the parents greater access to, the, um, to what's going on in the child's progress. And that's really the biggest thing that the uh, parents want. They wanted real time access to know mm -hmm. exactly. They don't want to be surprised for progress reports or when the grades come out. They want to know throughout the year how the student's doing, whether it's quizzes, tests, homework. And the communication tool, it's very easy for the teachers to send out an email uh, to a parent, to a whole class, however they want to do it, and the parents can easily get back. So the communication in that uh, regard has been improved a lot, um, as well as all the information that you can see on the, uh, the portal. Um, I'm going to actually go right to the portal to just show you. Picture's worth a thousand words here. Ricky has uh, kindly volunteered her daughter's portal. <laughs> it's just small enough that we can't see it exactly. There you go. Can you hit the control plus sign, plus sign? No. It doesn't work. Oh, um, I guess you could. Yeah. I guess. It's, yeah. So you really can't see it that well. Okay, let me go. It's okay. I was going to go raise your husband. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even going to bring that up. You have access other ways. Um, you want me to try to make that bigger? Can you? Is that helpful? That's fine, yeah. yeah. So cute. So this is what a parent sees when they first log in. Um, when they actually first <coughs> logged in, which you can't see because I'm in a uh, administrative mode, but when they first actually log in from the website, if they have students in different, or children oh, yeah. in different uh, schools, schools, they would have the option of going to mm -hmm. one of the other schools. Um, similar to the, look what same like icon when I went from Joshua Eaton to um, Parker, it looks the same. In the same school, if there are multiple children, you would see each child's picture here and you can click on them. Um, so this is basically what they see. Um, the attendance, uh, absence, dismissals, 
right away. Um, also on this home page here, if you will, um, there's the calendar, some school announcements, um, school links. I think Kathy alluded to this before. Um, here, you can post, because you have to sign into this, you, you have a little more um, flexibility as what you can post so that it's not public as the website is. So here, uh, we have Parker News Live. So parents can look here and click on the link and see what the uh, morning announcements were. But again, that's not available on the website because we don't have control of that and anybody can see it. So we want to keep it very private and very closed. Um, so anything that has like student names on it and things like that and I want to post it on there and share with the parents, I do it on the portal, not on the website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I go here to more, this is where you can get more information about your child. So um, off the top, it starts with the quarter. We're in, we're in the fourth quarter. Um, so the teachers, when they post the grades and make them public, that's when they will appear. Um, they're not always there, but um, there is a period, I think every two weeks, um, teachers are required to update that and to make sure that there is some information on there so the parents do have a snapshot of what's going on. Um, as you can see, Kate does very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so some you'll see that some averages show up and some don't. So the teachers can actually set it. So if they only have a couple of grades, they might say don't show the average. Oh yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So because yeah. it's not a good yeah right. vision so, of what's going on. But you can always on. see the grades over to the side. The um, scores would be here as well. So recent scores, recent tests, and things. So again, it's just a snapshot. How how are they doing this week? Last week they weren't doing so well. The homework wasn't done. I want to look and see if there's been improvement. So that's sort of the thing that you would use that for. Um, I'll say she's doing well, huh? I think she's I see pluses. Well. <laughs> um, if you wanted to look at previous quarters, you could as well. It will give you past quarters as well, so you can do the comparison to see what's going on and how things are progressing. Um, teachers, what you would see. So, for example, let's go to her sock class. So she has Mr. Toomey. And he has his welcome page, his class summary there. Um, he also posts links and files. Um, Mr. Toomey is always, um, he works with um, Smart Notebook, and he will post every day's lesson, in a sense. So mm -hmm. if somebody missed something or if you're absent, it's all there. Um, teachers are you know, using this in all different ways, but this is just how he is and they have all the links that are appropriate for the class and necessary. Again, easy, don't stop shopping. The, um, the students will have you know, the homework posted here and the information that they need right at their fingertips, so it is nice. The parents can also um, What are the, um, at the top, under, above the student's name, those are um, messages or? This here? That looks like IMs or. Please. Well, they're notifications. Oh, so it's just to so let that, you know. um, Yeah, if, they, if once a parent looks at the notification, so there, there could be uh, Ricky's email blast, it could be um, her newsletter that comes hmm. out, it could oh, be. Oh, new calendar. New calendar I mean, events, all, all of that, yeah. Did, did I see that there were filters available on some of those so that you could filter if you were looking, parent was looking, I just want to look at the social studies class or something, they can, it looked like there were some filters on the teacher's page. And that. Well, you could look at, I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, just so you can pinpoint, like right here under recent scores, that's all the different classes that a student is in? Under scores, these are the, um, the actual um, scores. This isn't going to take you anywhere, but here, under progress, you could go to the individual oh, okay. um, classes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, um, if you wanted to see the student schedule, you click on the schedule. Yeah. We have a six day rotation, which can be confusing, so this will pop up and show you your schedule. Um, if you know what day it is, you'll know where you're going, or if you need to figure out where your child is. You mean, at any moment in time I mean, people there. wouldn't have to have the schedules taped to the inside of their kitchen cabinets anymore? Nope. <laughs> Darn. There you go. Um, demographics. Um, parents can update their uh, some information, such as uh, email, um, telephone numbers, address. So it, it then feeds right into our database. So it's all trying to be streamlined, and everybody's talking to everybody, and it makes it a lot smoother. So if I hit edit here, you can see what they can. 
edit, and they'll come up with the boxes. What happens to the information once they edit it goes into a holding bin in the database, and then the school secretaries will look at it to make sure it's okay, and then import it if it's, you know, some mm -hmm. student has it not on there and written something or whatever, and make sure that the information is legit and good. Um, so that is... Oh, that's not the student changing the parents' phone. The other piece is the e-locker. That's where the report cards are posted. Also quizzes, um, you can hand it, it's like a homework hand in. So the, uh, the quizzes can be handed in here. The homework hand in and the e-portfolio will show you the report cards for each term. And they're all there in SJW. Any questions on that? I think Mr. Robinson has sure. one. Uh, yeah, maybe John, I mean, uh, so I guess I show my age on the committee. Uh, historically, we ran had issues in the past where not everyone was using headline the way they were supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Staff, uh, are we putting out training on this? And is what are we doing to make sure all the teachers are using this the way the parents want it to be used in terms of the information? So, yeah, that's a good question. Um, when we rolled this out, we did provide a training um, various ways. The tech integrators were the ones that really led the training um, piece. And there are uh, certain levels of expectation that the teachers are supposed to follow. The, the two-week posting is, is something that, you know, we're, we're doing at the secondary level. Elementary does not have as, they don't have this piece right. um, as much, but at the secondary level, but obviously this is used more for, the, for this purpose. Thank Just you. by the design of this, where it's all integrated, it sort of forces you um, yeah. to have meet those minimum standards of, of um, you know, compliance as far as what you're going to be doing and what we're going to require, because they have to post grades. So when they have to post grades, they, it flows through here. Mm -hmm. yep. So it is done. Um, and there has been a lot of training, and it's ongoing. Um, so. And even though the teachers, the teachers do seem pretty proficient with it, there's some, like the grade book yeah. has so many great they can use on it and the teach the certain teachers are, have superior knowledge of it and some use it for the basics but we still continue to offer opportunities whether it's right after school or we had an unconference and a teacher held a session during our unconference about um, you know higher levels of higher levels of use of the grade book so it's ongoing we don't just assume that people have reached their peak yet so and it's always changing Redditor is constantly updating it and constantly adding enhancements um, and then when those come out, we continue to do the training as well. Thank Mr. Plavin. Yes, I have a couple questions. Uh, one is, Redeker, how we how they get paid? So they get, will the cost of the system increase as the number, you know, as we add more data to it? Is it based, the, what's, what's the billing based on? No, it's based on the module. It's not based on the data. So no matter how many students we have in here, it's going to be based on it, the it's based. Yeah, it's based on the number of schools we have. Um, and I don't think that's going to change. Um, and it's based by the number of modules that we have with their program. So there's other pieces of the suite that we don't have, like the food service piece, and there's a business um, management piece. But we have Munis, so we don't use that one. We don't use the food service one. Um, so the, it's just the modules that we have is what we pay for, for the number of schools that we have. So just I want to keep on our radar screen going forward as we think about cost. We're kind of locked into the system, which is, looks really great and has a lot of functionality. I just want to think about we're kind of committed to it, all our data is in here, and do they raise the, if they raise their rates, is that a risk exposure for us? It sounds like it hasn't been so far, but once they have your data, the cost of getting out of the system you know, years down the road can be high if we ever decided they sure. were overbilling us. For and this. I think that would be the case no matter what system. I agree. Because uh, most school districts are moving to an integrated system. We have been uh, a customer of Redeker for since the 80s. Um, so, you know, they have a very good reputation and, you know, they've always been good to us. The customer service is excellent and that's a big piece of this. Right. Uh, a lot of other systems, and we did a lot of research last year yeah. in different systems. A lot of other services do not have the customer service piece that Redeker does. And we negotiate annually, or how long is the contract with Redeker? It's an annual, it's an annual okay. renewal. Any other questions on that? I was gonna switch gears. Anything else on cost? No. Go ahead. 
Okay, um, some questions about parents and, and what they can do with this. So um, can parents set alerts on here where like they wanna know if my kid has an incomplete assignment, I want to know about it, or if they have a grade below X, I wanna know about it. Not Does this have that capability? Send an alert through the teacher. <laughs> sure, well, there's always the old-fashioned way. Right? Yeah, uh, but there's no mechanism built in here to say if, if, if a grade is this, notify me. It's not capable of doing that, okay. Uh, and then the, the switching to the teacher side, can they see how a student performed in past years that were logged into this system? So if they have a student and they want to see like a social studies the example there, oh, you know, student's performance is this. I wonder how that compares to how they did last year in so-and-so's class. Not through this because the teacher will only be, um, have available to them their students and their classes. For that year. Well, you can archive it, certainly, and know it, but that's not going to help because if you didn't have that student in right, the past, right. you're not going to have the information. But there are other mechanisms yeah. um, that are in place. Can I just to follow up on that, though, what about the administrators? Because I think that's one of the things that we, that in, pa in some past conversations, may have talked about how, you know, the assistant principals or maybe even the guidance counselors um, would want to be able to, have that access if there's an issue with a, a student and you're trying to assist and help a student like an assistant principal would want to be able to quickly look at you know their the, the total portfolio of a student to say yeah we've got a problem in this yeah, area uh, but yeah assistant I'm principals and guidance can because they have different access to right the they have different levels of access does not have the level of that level of okay. access they can get that through administrators. but if so if a student was having if there was an issue a student was not doing well that teacher could certainly I mean, if, if not the department head, could certainly go to guidance Absolutely. and have that conversation with guidance and take a look at the whole portfolio for the student. Okay. I think that's the way the, that's been the flow since way before anything else. It's okay. always been, if you're a teacher and, you're, and you have that concern and you want an interest email, the guidance counselor now sends you back and now, all the relevant data right. you have. They've all, guidance counselors have always had it through admin plus, assistant principals have always had it through admin plus. I think the bigger difference is now they can they can access some of the more live data because the data is coming in much quicker. Before it was only based on quarters because Admin Plus only holds right. quarterly data. Now we can get more current data from it. Mm -hmm. Right, and that actually makes I think a fair amount of sense because if a student is struggling, I'd actually want that conversation to go beyond the classroom teacher to guidance or to an administrator to say, "Yep, it seems like your class specific. Let's talk about that." Or, "No, there's a trend here." And, and so it, that actually makes us a fair amount of sense to me that that's the, the flow. Mm -hmm. I think that was the issue. I know when we started looking at this, two, it was two years ago probably. It was two plus years that, ago, yeah. That was, you know, one of the, the issues was that lack of availability of the data or the difficulty with which you could access it meant that you just, you, you couldn't react as timely as you wanted to. So I think that that's... Mr. Barr. Same audience different questions so about for teachers is, is there any capacity or discussion or maybe we already do it of using this as a way to guide curriculum and pacing so for example if students in in three different classes are using the same textbook for the same subject and a way for teachers to see well you know these other classes are on chapter six and I'm on chapter four right now I'm behind or I'm on chapter six and they're on chapter four we all need to get to chapter 10 by the end of the month is there any ability to, for Reddick or to coordinate with the curriculums that we're using or the textbooks or something like that? Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, we go by the good old-fashioned system of having those, our teachers in both middle schools have um, prep times with teachers who are teaching the same subjects. Um, even if it's only once a week, it's, it's happening. So they're, um, they know where they are, they're planning together, they're not necessarily presenting things exactly the same way or giving the exact same assignments, but they, they really do um, communicate with each other the good old fashioned way. I think that to go, yeah. you know, that, I don't find that absolutely necessary um, to, to go on to here. I would hate to see that happen as they're going on to here to look to see where they are instead of talking to each other. That would mm -hmm. be. We'll say to the one thing to that point. Yeah, you, teachers can't see what other teachers are doing. Right. right. But one way that I think teachers can help do that, and it's it's very in the early stages, at least at the high school, but teachers are starting to use um, the lesson plan feature, which I don't know if you guys are going to show up, but there's a 
there's a way you can just basically set up, in, as opposed to just putting up an assignment and putting up the next one and hoping, and they all will fall in time order, you can set up units and then within those units set up lessons. And so, and you enter times when you want the lesson to be, you know, what day should students be able to see it, what day should they no longer be able to see it. I'm not sure that that's a key feature, but you can set all that up and then going forward in future years, you pull all of that data forward. So all of the work that teachers do will come forward. You would still need to have a conversation with another teacher. They couldn't see uh, my class and so forth, but um, the data is all in there that um, if a teacher wanted to pull it out, they could say, here's, what I, here's my lesson plans, how they're set up, and my unit plans and how they're all set up. Time-wise, you pull up yours and we'll compare and, and talk. They archive them on, all right. from year to year, so that they will. This is our first year with this, um, so next year we will train the teachers on how they, there's a closeout that they have to do, and then um, we will um, show them how to archive it and how to pull it up for next year. Because a lot of them will do that. They used to do that with deadline as well. So they, they save it. So they don't, you're not repeating, you know, you're not reinventing the wheel every year. Sure. Last question, I promise, on this topic. Is, is there any administrative feature to allow us to assess, I guess assess is the wrong word, but compare teachers and students across grades, curriculum, schools, whatever? So it's, for example, if, if you had a student who's getting, I don't know, a certain grade in a certain subject and they're being assessed a certain way um, in a standardized test, and you say like language arts, and you say, well, are, are, is performance in our curriculum in our, in our classes a good predictor of aligning with identifying students who may need additional support, for example, to make sure people don't fall through the cracks. So is there any way to look at, from an administrative point of view, across all students in a particular grade or a particular subject, how did they do, and then compare that to what we want to do is find these, these subpopulations that need maybe additional support before we have a situation where they perform poorly on a, on a standardized assessment. So can we target populations that are struggling or teachers that are grading easier or more difficult than other teachers? Do, do we use, does it have that capability? Do we use that capability? I think that's about a two hour presentation on MTSS. <laughs> I mean, can we do, yeah. no, I mean, I just wanna find, find students that use this, we, if we can, to find students that need additional support before it's a problem. So, so that's constantly happening. So and it's, again, that. it's using more of the meeting times and the data from that's discussed during those meeting times um, through our PLCs and other venues. Yeah, the, the one thing, if you thought about this like a, as a housing system, I guess you could, but there's also the respect and the confidentiality that your teachers see who they work with and not, not, not necessarily through this program looking at everybody, but during data meetings and during, during PLC meetings, yeah. that, that's literally the job is to look across to see um, what are the trends that we might be seeing? If we're seeing a global trend, what does that say to us about our curriculum? If we're seeing different pockets of strength, are there instructional differences that we can share strategies? If we're seeing individual student struggles, what is our next step for creating an intervention plan for that student or that group of students? But that has to come from dialogue, because we also know one data point does not tell you about a kid. No. So you, you <coughs> have to put it in the context. So um, this is more of a, a, you know, a global communication, and, a, and a, it allows us to communicate with home, um, it allows us to obviously track and store data and information, but that dialogue, which is the really rich stuff that determines what you do next, mm -hmm. is, is happening, but not necessarily based on the portal. The one thing I will say about this is it is great to be able to pull up attendance records and tardies, so that type of information is also important data, um, so that is a helpful platform to be able to access <coughs> that through. So a school principal, for example, would be able to look through this data set. And I could before, but now my yeah. teachers can. Now my teachers can look to see, I I'm feeling like so-and-so's missed this, Am I, is that accurate? And so that type of data um, is really, it's, it's nice to be able to have that at our fingertips as well. And you're keeping that it. Is, that is a good piece that um, we probably didn't articulate enough, that the teachers now have a lot more information at their fingertips than they did before, um, as far as parent contact, as far as the tardies, as, as far as all that. And that it has been a tremendous tool for them. And we're going to hold on to the data in here. This is going to be archived until the student graduates, or you know, how long are we keeping? The, the data is archived as part of their permanent record on Admin Plus. Which is the student we go way back. In that that's their class. student information. That's wow. the student information so management so system. That's it's where it's into ad administrators so it gets plus transferred the there and yes. held. Yes. kept there, and that's the record holder. Okay, that's so why the integrated system is so important. In the past, 
that did not happen. We had a third party grade book program, which we had to do take multiple steps to get it into Admin Plus. Now it's integrated so that one click here, it goes there. All right, one other thing I. And we can pull up, we can, you know, going back to the data meetings, each school has their data points that they look at when they have their data meetings. We pull it right from Admin Plus now um, and a couple other sources, but it's, it's easy for us to pull that information out to be able to have those conversations with teachers. So it's readily accessible. And if someone tried to log into this, like you log into Google and it tells you, hey, a new login attempt was made on your phone or something like this, if it's, even if it's your account, do we have security features in this that would identify new login attempts if someone probably not, a, maybe a student tried to log into this for, with a teacher password or something, would the teacher know? I know, well, the teacher might not know, but the parent would because I know I sat with a parent who couldn't remember her password. Yeah. So, um, so we went through it and, it and it locked her out and I had to go in. <laughs> yeah. So just if a student tried to log in to change their grades or something, like they would, but. Into the teacher's portal? Well, they, ca they can't change their grade. No. It's done through the grade book. The, the, parents, the parents don't even have The parents to can't change no, the but grade. A, a kid gets a hold of a teacher's login and tries to. Well, they'd have to get into in. the grade book. They can only but that could happen with any system. Right. Yeah. But they can only change their current grade of the teacher they hacked into. They could not change all of their grades. All of their grades. They couldn't give themselves all A's because that's all stored in Admin, Admin Plus, Plus, which is not web based. Okay. So they can't hack into that. The best they could do. If a student gets my login, is he could change anyone in my class, any of my students, their one quarter grade or one test grade if they wanted to. But you would you would know if it was that student's own grade. Would you know if someone else accessed? There's there's no way to know that someone else logged in. No. You can see login dates. Like I can look and see the last login date. So you can't see that. But but it'd be very tough to grab that type of data. I'm going to interject too. A lot of you, thanks. A lot of um, a lot of folks in the room know that I used to be a teacher. There's another security feature that isn't technology, but it's just a teacher, and so you know your students really well. And if you're going through the grades, you're, it'll yeah. jump out at you like, wait a minute, <laughs> that's not right. So it's an additional security feature. It's old school and old tech, yeah. but it does yeah. work. Dr. Doxer. Um, <clears throat> I just want to check something that I heard because um, I was really pleased to hear it. I've heard from both sides from parents, some parents saying they want to know grades faster and it, it's great information and then other parents that say, um, but the focus on grades, like it makes them a little crazy because they don't know if it's an anomaly or if it's a problem and then that all relates back to what Mr. Berman was saying in terms of the pressure on our kids. And I don't like the pressure that's on our kids. Um, I want to be nurturing our kids and encouraging them to succeed without um, having grades be the, or standardized test results be the do or die for them. It's real life stuff that's more important. So um, are these conversations that you're having with the teachers? Because I heard that you're not necessarily putting grades up right away and understood the intimation to be because it's not necessarily representative of a pattern. If they get one bad grade, it's not meaning there's a problem brewing. It might just be one blip. Right. Or missed homework or not. not um, I can adjust it or you can adjust that. Um, teachers are very cognizant of that. Um, and that's why they do have the option. That's why um, Redford provides the options of not making it public. So if you've had one quiz that was sort of even just a sort of a feeler, how are you doing, where we stand on this? Not fair to put that on the grade book or on the portal because it's not necessarily reflective of what the students really know or what they should know by that point. So they have the option of taking every quiz and test and either showing it or not showing it. Um, so yes, they are. There are narratives that are available on this as well. Um, where teachers could <coughs> send out a, um, an email to the, the parents or a narrative to the parents saying, um, you know, this is just a snapshot of where we are. This is not um, going to be not necessarily reflective of the entire quarter. Um, this is just the first test. Um, not all homework has been passed in. So there's, there, there is a conversation or a um, dialogue that can go on in that respect so that the teachers... Thank you, Mr. Robinson. So, just to that point, I, you know, I, 
So we're, teachers are making value judgments as to what they want to show in terms of the grades and the what there may be some parents that want to know how their students <coughs> did uh and well it, because the class didn't I, I think the way i heard it is because the class didn't do well on a certain no. uh no, no okay. if it's just like a if it's like a a pre-test or a pre-assessment on what they already know but they want to report it somewhere but they don't want it included in the grade they can choose they could even choose to show it and not include it in the grade like that's an option on, yes on this. not include the average yes yeah, yeah. So they just, just have flexibility. Um, it's not hiding anything. It's just being fair about the grading and being fair about where they really they really stand. But every two weeks, we they do need to post. So something has to go up. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to point out that we are. We do now. have other yeah. just okay. there are other yeah. pieces to this you, presentation. You okay. took the words out of my mouth. We're now officially past our agenda time, and we've got more to go. So, Mrs. Webb, I'll absolutely. No, that, that's okay. We'll keep going. You sure? Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So um, one of the exciting things that we were able to do this year with um, PLUS portals that we couldn't do in the past is we have now a online course sign-up process. So that in years past, it was every student of a particular grade got a form, they'd fill it out, they'd get some signatures from the parents, they'd get some signatures from the teachers, the exact order of that was not always done properly. Um, sometimes signatures were missing and so forth. So this now we have a, we went to this online process all through, all because now we have the plus portals. Mm -hmm. So the first part of it was teachers inputted their recommendations if they had them on it, on a class, on a student. So each student they would say, I think this student should continue in honors or maybe they should drop to SCP or maybe they should move up to honors or whatever it is. Um, and, and for say for English, for example, where they have several different offerings, they could recommend all of the offerings saying, I think you'd enjoy any of these, or maybe I think this would be a better choice for you. So they put that in. Once they put in their recommendations, students would go in and they would actually choose the courses they want. Next, parents would go in and they would approve requests and they could comment on it. So they could say, um, you know, I, I think my, my child should stay at this level. I think my child um, should take this as opposed to that. They could put in whatever comment they want. Those comments would then go to the guidance counselors who would see them. Guidance sat down and approved, um, electronically approved them, but they sat down with each student individually in, during English classes and sat down. They look at the screen and say, this is what you say. This is what the teacher says. This is what your parents say. Let's have a conversation if necessary. Most of the time there was, you know, you want this course and they want this course and the teacher says that's a great course for you and let's move on to the next topic. But every, the guidance approved the entire process. Then all of that data was sent to Admin Plus. So whereas before that all had to be hand entered mm -hmm. and you had keying errors, mm -hmm. um, you had forms that weren't complete, you had forms that were lost, we were chasing down everyone this way, everything was electronic. Guidance then went on and processed special cases in the case where a student might not have been given an option. Um, they're a freshman, but for some reason, in this particular student's case, they, they are allowed to take the senior course or, or vice versa. Um, they would special those, uh, schedule those special cases, and then the scheduling can begin. And this sped up the process uh, really fast for us. Our timeline, um, <coughs> the teachers, were given three days to put in, or four days to put in their data. Students were given a whole week and then actually um, their parents um, started on Thursday. So students were given two days before their parents were to start doing it. But um, in general, those two pieces, the students would do their piece and then the parent would do their piece. It didn't have to get really done until guidance started meeting with them the following week. And some of those meetings didn't happen for two weeks just because of the amount of time it takes to, to do that scheduling. Um, so we completed this process in a month. And keep in mind, there was a vacation week there. So really, within three weeks, we had this done much faster than anything we had done before, much more accurate. Um, this year, we came up with the 99% guideline. We weren't trying to get every single piece of data from every single student. 
right? There was just too many special cases, what ifs. What about this, you know, like I said, this special case where this student normally wouldn't be allowed to take a course but is or whatnot. Um, so we're aiming for 99%. To be honest with you, I think we aimed, we hit more like 99.99%. There were very, very few special cases that had to get scheduled through this. Um, and those fixes were just done by the guidance counselors through Admin Plus. Um, and so the, there are several key advantages to this. All the stakeholders got to state their preference slash recommendation. In years past, we know we had, uh, we had parents who would sign the form before teachers had filled in a recommendation. So they were signing a form blindly. Or, again, because students would, because students would lose forms, um, the parent would sign, and then, or the teacher would sign, and the parent didn't know what they signed, and so forth and so on. The other big thing is it's all documented and available. So now guidance counselors can go back and say, hey, you know, you wanted this course. You know, if, when a kid says, I don't want to be in this course anymore, wait, you did want to be in this course. You know, what's changed? Let's have a discussion there. Um, or a teacher tries to, you know, if anyone tries to change their um, recommendation, now we have a document to know where we started. Before it was all, I don't know, I think I recommended him for that class last year, you know, six months ago. Now we can go back, and so guidance has quick and easy access to all of that. Teachers also could see what happened. So if, if they recommended a student take a particular course and the, kid, the student didn't take that course, they could um, go to guidance and discuss with guidance. They could speak to the student or the parent so that everyone could kind of see and understand what was being um, thought through the whole process. And again, accuracy and speed were huge. Just to show you, um, when they went in, they were given, this is for 10th grade, this is for a 9th grader going into 10th grade. You can see that there were the choices. The other thing was a, a ninth grader couldn't sign up for English 12. They could only sign up for those choices that we gave them, um, which increased the accuracy. And they can see in this case, the English teacher recommended, you can take any English 10 course you want because I've, I've put down, you. I recommend any one of those words which wasn't available before. The teacher just wrote down one number. Right. Here the teacher can say, no, you could, you could move up, you could move down, you could, you know, and it gave a lot more flexibility in what was being um, thought of. Um, just a couple of other um, plus por portals opportunities. Just so you know, there is a, um, there's a student app, and it's very popular. Um, and I know you guys were discussing um, that update piece. Um, every teacher is doing it a little different this year. We're trying to feel our way through this. With, before with um, Endline, if I gave a grade, the student could not see it until I did that mid-quarter report and then the fine. So they could only see it twice. Um, no, I hand back the tests and whatnot, but this student only could see kind of a running snapshot twice during the quarter. Now, the way I do it, as soon as I grade it, I hand it back. They can see it on their phone. I've literally had kids see it on their phone and check it. And what's nice is they go, okay, you know, I, all the data is right. Everything matches. They can tell, you know, now I know what my new average is. Uh, at first, that was a little bit of a learning curve for both parents and students mm -hmm. where they thought, you know, my student's failing because on the phone app for the parents and for the student, it gives their quarter grade or it gives their current grade. So... Your child first night doesn't do the first assignment, they get a zero out of five. That's an F for an average. And parents, you know, complain, hey, how come my kid's failing your course? Wait, let's take a look at the data. And they have to just slide one screen over and they can see, wait a minute. My that was great graded on a homework, it was zero out of five. There's gonna be a lot more assignments. So now parents are starting to realize how the system works, what does that letter really mean? It's really just a, a current calculation and it doesn't represent what's going on. Um, and so there's a parent app available. It provides the data parents want. They can see their, their child's schedule on it. As soon as a grade's updated, they can see it. Um, and last, teachers are really starting to build out the online curriculum. Um, like I, I was saying, there's a, a lesson planner, which is really a unit and lesson builder. And what you'll see is going forward, all a teacher has to do next year is say, 
get me unit one from last year, and now they've got unit one already online. And so teachers are really starting to realize, build it once, and year after year, you can change and modify and add and subtract, but anything you've done before carries forward. Edline did not have that capability. Edline, you know, every year you were typing in the same thing, and so I think there was actually a disincentive of, you know, it's May, I don't feel like putting in this unit, or I don't feel like putting in this lesson, why am I gonna do it? You know, I just have to type it over again next year, so I won't. Now teachers are saying, yeah, if I type it in this year, I don't type it in next year or the following year, so there's a real incentive to, to documenting that. There's a, there's a learning curve to it, and I think teachers are just starting to really realize the power and benefit of that, but we are starting to see that more and more. What it looks like. Thank you so much. Thanks. So one piece that, um, before we start yeah. to share some of our information is, it's obviously a bit different at the elementary schools. Elementary schools, having a grading system on that standards-based progress, you're not getting in accumulating points, you're not looking at an average of a total. So the grade book and some of that real-time two-week data um, for assignments or homework is not something you're gonna see at the elementary level more at the secondary, simply because of the grading process. So if you're wondering why you're not giving a first grader a five points or a zero on that homework, you're really looking at their growth on the spectrum. So that is a little bit different in how and how, what that will continue to look like as we look at a grade book and an elementary version as we go is something that we're still learning. But um, uh, students that are in the elementary grades can access their report cards and their notifications, but that, every two week grading isn't right now developmentally appropriate at the elementary level. So. And I wanted, I just want to give um, kudos to Marsha and Meg and Kathy who have really um, put in a phenomenal amount of time on this. And continue to. I mean, <laughs> since, the first, day I started, right? <laughs> since <laughs> the first day I started July 1st, we were like um, up and running. She was in it. She has spent so much time on the phone with Redeker. They actually were have been asking her feedback on things. She's been collecting information for them. They've been trying to work with us and tweak it and, and make it work for us. So we much appreciate it. So thank you guys. So we have um, incoming communication. So how do the parents um, reach the schools? How do they get information they want? How do they start, the, start it? So um, this is just in general. Obviously, most often than not, I think parents will reach out through email. Sometimes they get um, emails from teachers, or the teachers' emails from the portal, having access to the teachers on the portal. I know one thing that I really love about the portal and sending out my communication from the portal versus sending it directly the way we used to from Admin Plus was, is that the parents can reply directly back to me and before it was a do not reply address. So I really like that. The parents feel like they have access. Um, so I can send it out to 800 something emails and um, you know, no one actually absolutely takes over advantage of it. You know, Appropriate questions come back and then that way I feel like it's smoother communication. Additionally on that point, um, I don't know about you, but uh, magically things will start to go to spam or go to junk or other things. So if you log into your portal, it's also there. So if for some reason you're having an issue and things are getting through to your personal email, the portal also saves a copy. So it pushes it forward, which has been nice too. So if a parent's mm -hmm. having problems for some reason with their own personal filter, that provides another uh, double in a safety. So I have had parents say to me, oh, I know you sent an email about that. I can't, re I can't remember what that was. Can you send that information to me again? And I can tell them you can get on the portal and, and see it there. It's really great. Um, so obviously phone calls. Nothing replaces a phone call. Um, important situations, obviously. Parents do call us, do call us all the time, and we respond to phone calls with phone calls. So, um, input forms. Oh. Yeah, so that's the something that's important. Good that's something it's a that, submission. Yeah, yeah the yep. submission form. But I think additionally, that's something that um, when Ricky and I were talking about the presentation, we were thinking about. We've talked a lot about how we get information out, but we know that it's I, it should be two way and it should be something that's cyclical. So. Um, in thinking globally too, especially this time of year, things like input forms of 
parental input forms, thinking about providing information for students that are transitioning to different grades, to different schools, um, and, and that important information that is helpful as we consider all of our students' needs. So that information, some of it's connected to the portal, but also sort of in just our general routines and our process for what we do to make sure that we're able to hear and capture the parental voices as well. So that is something that I know both um, Sarah Marchant and I put on, speaking for the middle schools for transition, we do have folders on our parent tab at the bottom of the website. One is access to transition documents and you'll find five to six, six to seven, seven to, seven to eight, so, um, and eight to nine. There's information about all the documents that we have pushed out right there accessible on the website. Um, so, and parents are accessing those because they have, um, you know, they've, they've called and they've said, well, I'm on the website and I know you said it's on the website, but where is it? And so we, we help them out. The <coughs> outgoing communication, that's a lot of what we've already been talking about. How do we push information out? A lot of this has already been, um, been discussed um, with the portal. Obviously, it's, it is our expectation for the middle schools that teachers are posting their homework um, on the portal. And um, I know that they had already talked about that's where I will put specific um, documents or things that nece not necessarily out for the public, but for parents specifically on the portal so they, always ha they can always refer back to it. Um, the grades being updated, our report cards, we've pushed our report cards out for the middle school all year. It has been a seamless process, thank you to Marsha and Meg, who've helped us, <laughs> helped us out with that. Um, we were able to push out the schedules in August that way, and we plan on doing that again this year. The other piece about the outgoing communication, the portal, and Ricky and I are sharing some information about the portal, but wanted to give you a global conversation because that's just one piece, obviously, of our communication pie. Um, but the other good thing about the outgoing with the portal is Previously, with Admin Plus, you'd have to contact the school secretary if your email changed, if, if mm -hmm. you weren't getting something. They'd have to go in, try to find the glitch, and issue it. Now, you can live time, update, or change an email, which means that day, you yeah. can update it, and that night, when that newsletter comes home from that teacher, it's coming right through, and it's, it's accurate. So that ability to make sure that, that you're getting that quick response in that real time, or you know your husband's work email is getting a bunch of the school stuff and you need to shift it, all of those things can be adjusted um, live time, which is really helpful. And we actually, after we sent out our report cards, got a few contacts from parents. Some were just in junk email and we showed mm -hmm. them how to access it in the portal. Mm -hmm. And others, it was just a typo. So we could help adjust that, mm -hmm. which also really helps us to have a more consistent and accurate contact. Absolutely. I think that we're more updated than, than probably ever because when I send out an email saying, you should be able to access your child's report card on the portal now, and I get you know, a handful of emails back saying I either forgot my password or I need to update my email address. So it really, um, we have a majority of our parents accessing that now. Whereas I don't think they were with Edline. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Especially not at elementary. Um, some of the other pieces we wanted to think about with the outgoing communication, and I, if you noticed me using my phone before, it's because I was tweeting out she that we were out. presenting about communication at school committee, so <laughs> check my Twitter feed. Um, but there's obviously a lot of different ways that we're sharing out information, and Dr. Doherty did reference it. Um, the reality is there's a massive list of potential ways we could share out, and we didn't want to overwhelm, but we know that depending on your comfort with technology, depending on your age, depending on what you have on your phone, you might prefer email, you might prefer Twitter, you might prefer Facebook, you might prefer blogs, you might prefer Instagram. So depending on your perspective and your interests, obviously how you choose to access in and something that I share um, at my meetings with my incoming kindergarten parents is you can kind of pick your flavor and find a, a route in. There's a lot of different ways you can access. So the benefit of having all of those different tools is that depending on your comfort and familiarity, you can find that in point. So we do a lot of outgoing communication across the different schools through some of the different social media. And similar to what Dr. Doherty mentioned, a lot of them are linked. So there's ways that we can program it. So if it's posted on the blog, it's immediately kicked to Facebook, it's immediately kicked to Twitter. So you can have access in different ways. Um, Myself, for example, I'll often use Twitter to share out about what's happening in the school day, just randomly, you know, as I'm walking through classrooms, as I'm in the hallway, and just capturing something that's happening within that learning as a quick short term. And then I'll use my newsletter to share links about some of those pieces, and I'll use a blog 
to share more current events. You know, I wrote one about fidget spinners last week, for example. So <laughs> depending on what's going on, um, I'll use different tools, but they are all connected. So if you're looking to find that connection in, there's a lot of different ways to get that access. And this is all in addition to our school portals and our school websites. And then two-way communication, which is, is is probably the most important um, to make sure that parents know in addition to having access to reviewing things that are going on in the school how are we able to get them to experience that as well and be and feel like they're a part of the community and I know that at elementary school there are more opportunities for that but um, but at the middle school or at all levels we have our PTO meetings we have our school councils we try to tweak the times on those so that that people you know you can have one or two in the morning and some in the evenings um, um, we have, I know, um, we have principal coffees. I know at the middle school, at, at Parker, we have, um, early on in the year, have team coffees. So the parents can come in and meet the teachers and talk to the teachers in a social format, um, which is highly well attended. Um, we have different committees. So you have the WASH committee at the elementary schools that parents are involved in, orientations at the beginning of the year, open houses, curriculum nights, <laughs> you name it. Um, Transition meetings, so we've been um, having lots of transition meetings, and um, I know I came to the elementary schools for their PTO meetings to try to help fifth grade parents feel a little bit more comfortable, um, but we kind of work together to try, to try to give those opportunities to the parents to have conversations with us and be involved in the school. And I think similar to what um, uh, Mrs. Borowski mentioned earlier with having the, the superintendent coffees, just knowing that they're there, allows you to know that when I have something, I know how to get there. One of the most frustrating things is I have something, I have no idea who to go to, or when to go to, or how. So I think it get, it's similar to the technology side, that having multiple methods to get into the school, whether it's to connect with a teacher, or a specialist, or an administrator, or uh, maybe other parents, that there's many different ways to do that. Because I think the conversation is obviously not just one way, it needs to be two way, but it's not just linear teacher to parent, often it's parent to parent, or it's multiple staff members that might connect with your students. So thinking about these multiple opportunities, I think some of the best conversations I've had is, um, you know, some of these pictures are like kindergarten information night is when the three parents will come up together and ask the same question, and then they start to talk to each other, and magically we have a playground, you know, play date happening before kids start, and we're already building connections, so that, that it really starts to build the network and starts to build that feeling of community rather than it being sort of an information delivery service. And so a, a lot of those opportunities, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, but thinking about the councils and the committees that people have an opportunity to step in on. They might not be able to commit the time every time, but knowing that they're there might mean, I know my neighbor is on that, and when I ask that question, that information will come back. Maybe it's directly to me, maybe that question triggers a blog post or a newsletter information sharing or a direct communication or an invite to join a committee perhaps. So um, again, it, 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 the idea is that it's continuing the dialogue in a really broad sense. Um, and it might be focused on something you're particularly passionate about, maybe a safety committee, or in a more global scale to have a better understanding of the goings on of the schools in their districts. So, so then we also listed a couple of things um, such as, let's see, I think there's more here. Um, so I know at the middle school, um, we've, we're really, I'm really talking to the teachers a lot about providing opportunities for parents to come in and see things that are, that are happening. So it's, it's kind of tough at the middle school. So the, the kids appear that they don't necessarily want that, but I'll tell you our parent visitation day in January, highly attended. Um, we had about um, 160 of our sixth grade parents come, um, standing room only. Seventh grade, there were about 110. There's only 175 kids in that grade, so I'll, I'll give them that. Um, and then eighth grade was about 95, or a little, a little under that. Um, so the, as you can see here, the parents come, and they, they sit in the back. Um, sometimes they do, um, the teachers will have them get involved and work in groups with their kids and things like that. But we have, um, we've had several parent showcases. We're going to be um, having our science expo day. The parents will be able to come in and see, see some of the work that's been done. So. Um, trying to give more opportunities for parents to come into the middle school. Um, yeah, and, and again, I think they're sprinkled throughout depending on what school and grade mm -hmm. your student's in. Today, for example, my fourth grade um, 
students had their Generation Day project, which is when they interview no. someone from two, do you remember it? Yes. Ricky was a mom at Barris. Um, they interview a family member from two generations mm -hmm. prior, and then from when they were in fourth grade, and then they share a bit about their experience in history. And then the, it's often a grandparent um, or great aunt or uncle actually come, and then they sit together, and the student shares their project, and then the grandparent can speak to their experience. And it's, again, it's, it's a really lovely opportunity both for the student to showcase their work to an authentic audience, but also it's building that network. And today I was actually in a fourth grade room and the grandmother that was up front shared that she was a teacher at Barrows 50 years ago. And she said it was pretty incredible to be back. So, um, you know, a, a great showcase and experience, but also really a nice way to continue to engage dialogue about what life was like 50 years ago at our school and compared to today. <laughs> no, I think it's back, I think it's back to me. Are there any questions for us about the school days communication? I don't have a question, but I have feedback. I have a student who is transitioning from one school to another in the district, uh, and I've been deeply impressed by how thorough the communication has been. It started in like March, <laughs> and it, it makes you feel really safe. Like there's a really thoughtful, ongoing opportunities to get ready to, for the next school. To, it's just, it's been really phenomenal. And um, so far, all of the forms that I filled out have been online. Love that. <laughs> Love that. Um, so, thank you. Dr. Nine. Um, just a quick question, more more towards middle school, uh, Principal Shanklin. Um, has there been like an, I know you weren't there last year, but is, have you heard about it, an increase in inquiries from parents, um, particularly, you know, regarding grades, obviously, um, based on the fact that at the elementary school, they're used to uh, standards-based grading, and all of a sudden they're getting an A or a B or a C, and, no, it's usually an, oh, thank goodness for the grades again. <laughs> That's what I get. Um, <laughs> so um, we have gotten, we got a little bit of that. Um, but no, and honestly, um, I think that's something that teachers were a little bit a little bit concerned about um, was this instant access. I'm going to get flooded with emails every two weeks when I send this out. And, I, you know, so, so <coughs> mindfully, they're trying to be even more proactive on their end so that when things go out, it's not a surprise, which is not a bad thing. But, um, but. It hasn't been. Um, they, we actually were just talking about this um, in a meeting, and the teachers were saying, "We're, you know," and I had already gone through that transition at my former school. So I had said to them, "You know, going from not posting every two weeks to posting every two weeks, you're not going to. See, parents will just be more informed. You're not going to get the flood of emails." And and they said, "You were right. It isn't. It really hasn't happened." Um, they do think that parents, you know, the ones who want to be who want to be in the know about how the kids are doing are, are paying attention. Um, but I think the teachers do a great job of reaching out and not waiting until something. You know, yeah, that's something I was I was wondering if there would be. So it's good to hear that it's not really a, an issue or increased workload on teachers. And then the other question I have is like, so Edline and, is Edline, Edline still um, a viable piece of this? Is that correct? No. No. Because no. I've the websites, you could find them, but they're not, we don't access them, we don't change, those are old, outdated websites. Yeah, we don't use I've at seen all. like a mix, like I've seen some like, you know, 17, 18 information, um, yeah, 17, yeah, 19, well, I guess that would be this year, so maybe it's not, but just information, it looked like there was some information that was relative to what was going on now, but maybe that's not the case. It could have simply been when we phased it out it, up through the spring of last year, and then we transitioned most of us in you know over the summer in the fall to this new website so it could simply be that outstanding information that was done yeah. previously so I, I do know like if you google it yeah that'll yeah. come up yep. before i think the portal yep. will come up yep. so i don't know is there something over time, it'll, yeah over time it's, it's, it's yeah it used to come up a lot more it does it's not, not come up. it does not take it down though we have asked Edline several times <laughs> to deactivate it and they won't really yep but now we have a link that, that comes to our website when you click on that, it goes to that. Yeah, and then the other comment too, I know there's a lot of work um, getting this all up and running and um, I've seen it happen in, in, uh, when I was in Danvers. But um, one thing that I find a little bit challenging is, I, I think I may have mentioned it, is if I want to contact a particular teacher. Um, so I'm looking at it from my perspective, like if I have a student teacher um, as, I, as I work as a, a supervisor for student teachers at Salem, and I want to get a hold of a particular teacher, I find it hard to get their email address. 
Is there is that purposely or is that so since you br since you brought that up, we have added the contact list to all the web pages. Oh, okay, so yep. it's in there. All right. You brought that. I believe it was at a meeting. You brought that up. Yeah, I did bring it up once before. So yeah. under the so it's probably that's probably why it's probably it's under the parent tab. I know at Parker under the parent tab it'll yeah. say contact. It'll I usually say go staff to the parent list. Tab, there's yeah. the staff list there. But um, so it's there now. Good. Yeah, it's called. It's been, there, it's been there since the fall. Wait, isn't it called like staff oh, list really? on every page now? So it has like the same. I, I think, think we've also added the. I think we've also added uh, the spreadsheet with the email addresses. Yeah. On each website yes. now. Okay. So great. you don't even need to be in the portal. Correct. Yeah. So for no, people who don't. <laughs> Anything else from the committee? Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Doxy. Um, when we were running. For a school committee, one of the questions that was asked at the candidate forum was about volunteerism and um, the they asked whether why it was declining so and I've seen so many passionate volunteers and active volunteers examples I was just at the ice cream social at Joshua Eaton I've been to a lot of the different schools and seeing so many volunteers, but that's my perspective. I'm not there all the time. And you're, you were talking about doing events to nurture those connections. I was just wondering what you're seeing in terms of volunteerism. So for example, I guess it depends on what it's for. So if I ask, say, I need volunteers to come in during eighth grade lunch to do something, yeah. I get very few. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise. Thank you, that for some reason. But, um, um, or like teacher signer, things that, you know, little things like that. But talking about, we're having um, a writing celebration on May 31st, having author Tara Sullivan coming in. We put something out um, to our parent community first through Dr. Doherty's um, newsletter. We um, have reached out to multiple um, people within the community trying to get volunteers to come in and help out with that day to, to run short workshops. Um, that things like that have been kind of hard. I think people are. I, I don't know if the comfort level with middle schoolers is as is as great as it is with elementary, elementary kids. Well, and I don't know. Fun. I mean, my question would have been declining since when? Um, I, I think something that shifted over the last two decades, decade is that more and more often both parents are working, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that um, if you're looking from, you know, fifteen years ago or twenty years ago to now even that short of a span of time, um, availability of parents is different. So I guess the question is, what are you asking to ask someone to volunteer a full day a week, every week, is not something that most families can do. Mm -hmm. So it's the type of volunteers that might look a little different. And you know whether we're coming in during the day or volunteering for weekend events or after school events, or I'm volunteering from home, cutting a, you know, ribbon for a craft fair on the weekend, you know, it, it, the volunteerism type might look different and sound different. I wouldn't say declined, but I think there's also a wider range of opportunities for volunteerism, and it might be being a committee member, it might be holding a PTO board position, but I think more and more, the type of volunteerism just is more varied. Um, and so I, I think that's where, you know, volunteering opportunity for field trips, um, we can't honor all of the ones I want to jump in on that. So uh, I, I, I don't think declined is the right word, but I do think that for so many of our families, um, how they're able to volunteer looks really different. We have limitless volunteers for things that we need behind the scenes. I think within the school, sometimes it's, it's harder, but definitely behind the scenes we get what we need. Just the, the quick data, even in this district, I think it was in 2003, 25% of the students were in full day K, and 75% were not. And it is completely flipped on its head now, and would be probably it's closer to 80 percent or more if we had the space right so that's I think I, I really appreciate what you said about how about how it looks there's different modalities for the volunteering and it's just more varied so I think the key is um, you know finding maybe in terms of what you need mm -hmm. Finding sort of that slice where somebody can do something or having the relationship with parents so that they can say, look, I can't do X, but I could do Y. Does that help you? And you. I have a question, and I'm, I'm, it's getting late, and I want to be cognizant of the time, but I, it is an important one. Um, and it's around student privacy and protection. So there's obviously a lot of data now out there, um, personal data, demographic data, grades. Um, so how... I, Redeker's a company that does this 
that's what they do. So I assume this has been addressed. But can you talk briefly about um, how student privacy and due to student data is protected? The it's all there's there's protections in place for all of the data um, and multiple layers of it um, without going into detail. But that's a question that we checked out many times before we move forward with this um, because it is cloud based. I mean, certainly we have those questions, yeah. and we also asked other districts the same question um, that that use the Redica product and other products. Um, but we do there are multiple protections in place. Thank you, Doctor. Is the information in this Redeker system transferred out? You said like the grades was, was, was a grade book or something. There was some other. It's, a, it's the same program. It's all integrated. No, but there was, a, there was another record keeping archive that was mentioned earlier. That admin that's plus. Admin Plus. Admin Plus. So that's part of Redeker. Oh, that's also part yes. of Redeker. So it just moves out of the grade book. The, only place, the only place where the data goes, if it goes anywhere, is to DESE. Right. That there is okay. certain DESE yeah. in EastBed, East which is the special ed program. But we have to report certain data from Admin Plus to DESE. But the archive is kept also within Redeker. Right. Everything's in Yes. Right. Okay. Just one quick question. So a permanent file in the old days was an actual <laughs> file. So Paper. there's no such thing now. It's all electronic. No, we still have cumulative do folders you, that do we keep paper okay. copies, yes. yes we, we, have to, we have to still have permanent student records uh, that we have to keep 50 years, I think, or something like that under Massachusetts law. Cer did certain wow. records, though, go home with the seniors? Yeah, some go home with the seniors, but we have a permanent record that's one oh. card that we have to still keep. For, I think it's 50 years. Wow. Anything else from the committee? From the public? Oh, yeah, this way. Are you going to talk more about the website? or is this I, think no, we're, that's, that's I think we're wrapping it up, so if you've got a yeah. question. I do have a question. Well, I have future plans. I'm not done yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> There's one oh, more side. She's yeah. got the microphone. Yeah. We'll, we'll ask. You ask your question. Alicia Williams, 40 Marlow Lane, parent. <laughs> Uh, as you know, the site's been out for a year, um, and a lot of key pages are not populated. Do we have a hard date when those pages will be populated? I know that some stakeholders are looking for key contact information, and if they don't know how to spell the name of the teacher, or it's a phonetically, you know, spelled name, then they might not be able to find the teacher. Um, Nick had asked a question where visitors per pages on Redeker, the, um, sorry, I lost my place. There are pages that are visited often or not often. Are we, as he had asked, are those pages, people are, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Um, can we prioritize the pages that are not being hit, um, th that are being hit and not being hit? Can we identify them? Thank you. Okay, <laughs> just, just want to make sure we're clear. I don't um, do well public speaking, yeah. I'm sorry. The first, the first no question, we do have all the teachers' names are on the main website of each school. Right, but the pages for certain um, learning and technology uh, page I don't believe is populated so I'm wondering if that's a page that are you talking about on the school pages or on the on the Redeker website like the the, the, the main big district website yes so we're in the process of, of doing those pages I don't have a hard date for you okay I, uh, all of this is done by us Okay. We don't have webmasters. We don't have other people. Right. It's all done by us. Right, which was another question I was going to say that there are parents and kids who are tech savvy. Is it something that can be a summer internship program that we could utilize volunteers? I know I'm tech savvy. You know, I could volunteer my time. I know I've talked to Debbie Butts about helping the RISE page. So those are just my quick Thank comments. Thank you very much. So that's an idea I think we could take under advisement. And yeah, in some cases, yes. In some cases, unfortunately, not. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one more slide. All right. So, a um, couple things going on in the fall that we're looking at. So we, or actually in the spring. So there's some. We've been. We started filming last week. We're going to do another one this week. They haven't been shown yet, but we're doing some local cable information sessions on RCTV um, about the Reading Public Schools. Last week we did. Um, the uh, STEM areas. Uh, this week, I believe we're doing the arts. Um, so our goal is to um, get those out there, and um, they're like one half hour infomercials about the Reading Public Schools. Um, and our plan is to continue those, but we're doing everything we can to get that information out there. Um, in the fall, probably in early November, we are going to hold a parent university. 
uh, on a Saturday. We're for the for a morning. We are holding all kinds of different workshops that parents can attend. We'll have babysitting service available, um, and it'll be all kinds of different topics that we hope will be of interest to parents. Um, so that's coming up. Our um, Sandy Calandrella, who you met last meeting or two meetings ago, <laughs> um, is spearheading that. Uh, and so uh, we're very excited that we're going to be doing that in the fall. If it's successful, we may also do it in the spring um, with some other topics as well. Uh, as part of the audit, they talked about forming an advisory council. Um, so that's something that we're going to form in the fall. And then from that, the council will determine a survey that we'll do on communication as well to get feedback on a lot of the changes that we've been making and if there's room for improvement. So that's what we hope to see in the future. Thank you. Anything else from the committee? I have one. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I just checked every site, and on every site you can go to About Us at every school and you hit staff. The next drop down is staff, so it's oh, consistent. Every single one is exactly the same. I just, I've had the same issue that Gary had as now that I don't have parent, uh, kids and I'm not on the portal, I still might want to email teachers because I miss them. And, um, I want to make sure I'm sending it to the right email address. So it's all there. Every single one is exactly the same. And I believe when Mr. Nyan brought that up, I checked with the tech integrators, and some pages already had it, so others did not, and we immediately made that consistent. Thank you. Dr. Thompson? Um, I have a question. I should have asked it before. I forgot. About the calendar. Um, is there a way that the calendar, the district calendar, can link to the different school calendars? And maybe I went on to the calendar wrong, but when I went on, it had a few district dates, but it had more RMHS dates on it, but it didn't have, like, the Pathways has a whole lot of dates from all the different schools, but the district calendar, I didn't find them on the district calendar. And I was just wondering if there was an easy way that it could link to feed the district each school when their dates are entered whether that could feed the district calendar um, the answer is no um, we the calendars a work in progress um, it all has to be done manually um, Linda does the district um, and so we're trying to figure out a way to make that that's hard yeah so we're working on it thank you but the the pathways is probably the most up-to-date um, every Sunday, because we have about two weeks worth of dates on there. And that's very timely. You're yep. getting it right as the dates. Yep. Yeah. Anything else from the public? I want to thank you all for being here tonight and all of the work that you've done. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll let people get home and try to get a few hours of sleep. Um, we should move on to reports. Start with Alex. Have you got anything? I have lots of stuff. Really? <laughs> yeah. You should be kind of like coasting yeah. now. <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, the end of the year for seniors, so so uh. we get out on um, the 19th, so next Friday. Um, after that week, there's a ton of stuff. We have prom, which is the 26th of May. Um, we have the boat cruise and an all-night party on May 30th. Um, class day and graduation practice is June 1st, and then we have graduation on June 4th. Um, there's also the NHS induction and Century Club um, ceremony is May 10th, so Wednesday, um, in the pack at 7 p.m. There's also um, the Senior Awards Night on the 16th. And there's a band and a chorus concert next week. Um, Wednesday is a band concert, and Thursday is a chorus concert at 7 p.m. in the pack. And we'd love for everybody to come. Thank That's you so it. much, Alex. <laughs> um, What's next? Committee reports. Wow, well, I can't make my pencil. No idea what busy. happened right since the last time we met. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> um, the Human Relations Advisory Committee is meeting this coming Thursday. We're delayed because of town meeting last Thursday. So 7 o'clock at the police station. Um, welcome to Mr. Arena Selectman, who's our new liaison. So we look forward to working with you more. Likewise. Um, I went to the elder services workshops. I went to one of them and was um, 
really impressed by the feedback and the thoughtful musings or reflections of the seniors that were there, and I just wanted to pass on. Um, I understand there was a lot of discussion of the schools in the afternoon one, but I went to the evening one. But there, there were also people that were talking about um, the resources from the schools, the drama, the band, um, that they were resources that they enjoyed taking advantage of. Um, just recently, the National Honor Society played cheer volleyball with the seniors, and that, I guess, was a blast. Um, and there's also a reading program that was an, um, discussed, I believe it's Joshua Eaton, where there are elders that come in and volunteer to do reading with the students, and um, they love it. And seniors will forego their trips down south in order to make sure that they can keep their commitment. It's a real solid um, program. And um, also, um, CPAC has been active. I'm going to let Mrs. Wilson um, report on that. I wasn't able to go to the last one. Um, and um, there's a police open house coming up on May 13th, so I wanted to give a heads up to folks May 13th from 10 to 1. And that was mine. Thank you. The only thing I'll add is town meeting Matt wrapped up Thursday night. Um, I, for one, was very pleased with the outcome. Um, I, I suspect I speak for all of us on the budget vote. Um, the ability to maintain the middle school language program for one more year is something to be very grateful for, and I am very grateful for it. Um, also wanted to take a moment to thank John for his work and his presentation, and um, very much Gail as well. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about you over this weekend as you wrap up your first budget process, and I wanted to remind you <laughs> that uh, when you interviewed, you said something along the lines of, I want to bring my private sector experience and do something good in the public sector. And you really did, and you continue to. So I hope that that continues to motivate you. We are very grateful. Thank you. Anything else from the committee? OK, report's over in that table. I'll, I'll give a brief update, if that's all right. So I just want to acknowledge the 30 athletes that we sent to Special Olympics which it was very special while we were at town meeting. Um, the teacher that sponsored that, Tara Hurley, he sent an email and it just gave me the opportunity to reflect on the fact that this is why we're all here and the great pictures that Dr. Doherty shared through the pathways of our students and the students back here in our schools who celebrated those athletes upon their return. It's a very special day for our students and it's a wonderful opportunity. So um, check out the pictures. There's some on the high school website as well. I'm gonna be putting some on my website. Um, it was really a great day. So I wanna acknowledge that because that's really um, a big focus um, of what we do um, is creating those opportunities for our students. Uh, the other pieces I wanted to give an update, we did have the Department of Education out on April 25th and April 26th for our mid-cycle review. Uh, that was two days and basically consisted of record reviews, some interviews with myself and a couple other staff. Um, I'm hoping we'll have the report by summer. I really didn't get a sense of where we stood. There were a couple pieces of documentation we needed to follow up with, so uh, we'll keep you posted when we get um, the report out from them. Um, we also, as I had mentioned at our last meeting, we have some movement in our team chairs. So currently we have two vacancies. One is a position at the high school, um, Jane Finger. It's not gonna be returning next year. She's already retired and um, did us a huge favor by supporting us this year. So, um, so we do have a vacancy at the high school and then with Kelly Bostwick moving to Rise Preschool, there is currently an opening at Wood End and Birch Meadow. So those positions have been posted and we've been interviewing and hopefully we'll have some of that finalized soon. Um, uh, Thursday the 27th, we had a presentation from some of our school psychologists um, on the role of the school psychologist. Um, you know, we had four or five parents who came but had fantastic questions. Um, Dr. Kim Bernazani, who works at Parker, and Dr. Flory Johnson, who is our district-wide evaluator, were the presenters. And it was a great opportunity for parents to, to have a dialogue um, about what their role is, what the test, um, tests and evaluation tools that they use within the school are, 
what are some of the things that our school psychologists have the ability to do. Um, we, Alicia is hoping to have a CPAC meeting this week, so that's to be determined um, to go over the bylaws, so that's still looking to be posted. Um, some, the CPAC did share some concerns about NRT, and I just wanted to follow up that based on that, I did reach out to all of our team chairs and our principals as well to see if there were any concerns that they had heard from staff um, or from parents. And I've also reached out um, to NRT to just sort of schedule an end of the year meeting. Um, I've had several meetings with them this year um, in larger groups and small groups. So I've had regular communication with them. So I do ask if parents do have concerns to definitely reach out to us. Um, they are very responsive to us as a district. And um, when we do have concerns, they do address those pieces. So um, that's very helpful. So I think that's it on my end. Uh, I just have one uh, additional item. I was going to mention Special Olympics, but Carolyn did, so that's great. Um, I, we, uh, I want to just read an email that was sent out by Adam Bacher, the principal at the high school, uh, this afternoon regarding a graffiti incident that happened last, late last week. Um, Good afternoon, Reading Memorial High School community. I am disappointed to report that last week several students discovered a SWAT sticker drawn on a floor tile in a foreign language classroom. These students quickly scribbled out this hurtful symbol and then reported it to an adult who then informed school administration. At Reading Memorial High School, we strive for all students and staff to work towards promoting and attaining not only the core values of scholarship and perseverance, but also the core values of respect and responsibility. As a result, while there is certainly plenty of room for respectful disagreement and debate here at RMHS, there is absolutely no place for hate of any kind in our disagreement and debate here, I'm sorry, in our school community. We are committed to helping students to express themselves honestly and authentically, but to also do so in a respectful way that allows for growth, but also makes all of our students feel safe and important, even in disagreement. Obviously, the work of promoting tolerance, acceptance, and respectful debate is an ongoing process with young adults and presents itself often in, a, in unpredictable ways that fall beyond the scope and sequence of our daily curriculum. At RMHS, however, we hope to capitalize on these teachable moments, although painful and uncomfortable, and help bring students to a place of mutual respect regardless of each other's differences. Regarding this unfortunate act of bias, we've been investigating the situation and will eventually issue discipline to the student or students involved, as well as education and restorative justice. Our guidance counselors and administrators have also been having discussions with and offering support to students who may have seen this symbol and asking them for input on improving issues of respect and tolerance. From these early conversations, we hope to reach out to different departments and find regular, reoccurring places to insert these themes of acceptance in a way that makes it an ongoing part of our daily and academic social, and social life. Lastly, in the next couple of weeks, we will be meeting with student leaders in each of the grade level classes to review and hopefully adopt a student-driven message pledging respect and tolerance for every member of the RMHS community. Although these messages of bias and hate may unfortunately occur from time to time, RMHS stands united in spite of our individual differences, ready to accept everyone as a member of our proud community and to stand up for those who may be rejected, even if only by a few. If you have any concerns regarding bias or discrimination, please contact your child's guidance counselor or administrator immediately. And thank you for all your support of our RMHS community. And that was sent by Adam Barker. Um, last week when we were told of this incident, um, we immediately followed our protocol for that we use that has been provided for us by the Anti-Defamation League, um, which pretty much follows the format that Mr. Barker has outlined um, in the communication. Um, the, on, the investigation is still ongoing. Uh, police have been notified um, as well. And so when we have some updates, we will give you further information. Thank you, Dr. Dory. I could make a quick comment. I've sure. read that. I'm sure um, several of us have, although that letter just was released this evening, mm -hmm. shortly um, prior to our meeting. And I just want to say that I am. I I actually made some notes. I didn't know Dr. Darty was going to read the letter. I actually made some notes because I think that there are several really important aspects to um, Principal Bacher's letter, and I think it's incredibly well written. So. Um, I think, you know, certainly that um, 
that this is a place where you know we are going to promote tolerance and acceptance. The focus, as as I believe Adam always is, on the teachable moment, uh, the discipline, but the restorative justice and the education. What can we learn from this? How can we move forward with it? And I was really um, inspired by that, and especially um, the focus on developing a student-driven message um, of respect and tolerance so that um, the community um, stands united in spite of individual differences and really accepts everyone as a proud member of the community. I was re really impressed with the letter. It's a difficult situation, and I so I want to thank um, Principal Bakker um, and Dr. Darty and the, the staff that may have been involved in, you know, just really helping to pull that together. But it definitely has Principal Bakker's imprint on it. Thank you, Mrs. Holmes. Anything else from the committee? Mr. Chair? Mr. Evans. Thank you. Um, John, what is the protocol? Do you have to do every year? Um, what is the call for? What is the order of events? So once we're notified, we, we start to investigate the situation, which is what we did on Friday. Um, once we have enough information, then we communicate out to the community, which we did this afternoon. Um, and also in that communication, it, as part of the protocol, you talk about what we know right now, that it's an ongoing investigation, and what we're going to do moving forward to educate um, and address the situation. The authorities were called this morning after we did our investigation. In the protocol, though, and what part of the protocol would you uh, suggest the authorities be brought in? It, this morning is when we oh. when we notified the, the police. Is that? No. I would have expected that they might have been brought in sooner, that the protocol you follow might have brought them in sooner, no? Uh, we were still trying to figure out what was going on. We didn't get a chance to speak to the students. And as a school, um, that's the, we do our internal piece to take a look at what's going on and then notify police if necessary. And that's what we did. What I heard you say is that there's an internal investigation to understand the circumstances Correct. before determining that authorities Correct. seem to be called. It also sounds like that happened within a day. It did. A day. Thank you. And we found out about it on Friday during the day. Dr. Dawson. I, I was just going to say the turnaround was very fast because I got the email from a parent and connected with um, Dr. Darty and, and um, Mr. Barker, and it was immediate. The response was immediate that things happened. So, um, and the resource officer? School resource officer, Mike Mulo. Is, is cognizant of what's going on as well? Yeah, he was, he was the one we notified. So I mean, uh, Lieutenant Abardi were involved in it, I mean, in terms of the communication. Thank you, Dr. Doxer. Mrs. Wim? Yeah, I, I think, though, in general, it's important to understand that we have a large number of different policies um, and that as a result of um, infractions in those policies or procedures, plus as well as, the, the, you know, things that are in the student handbook, there's, cert there's a response protocol that's in there. And I, I think that for one of the most important things at, in terms of the educational setting is really what, what um, Adam emphasized is that we execute on our discipline and, and, and what those guidelines are and at what time frame um, you involve uh, the police and it depends on what the issue is, but that it's focused on discipline but also restorative justice. The idea here is to have people learn you know, why this was hurtful and what the right behavior is. And that's the case whether we're talking about this or we're talking about bullying or we're talking about our, our chemical abuse, our, our chemical and substance abuse policy. Students, we want students to learn new behaviors. And we need to help understand, you know, what that, what the driver behind that behavior was in the first place. So I think um, there's a, I think we've had a, what I've seen over, um, with um, super, late Superintendent Scatini's relationship with Chief Cormier and what Dr. Daugherty has continued in our district is just an incredible relationship with the police department that enables us to really maximize, you know, our ability to address situations in an educational setting, involve the authorities in, in the right ways at the right time so that you can really make it the, um, develop the best solutions for all those who are impacted 
um, the student who may have made the mistake as well as the students or the, the people who are impacted by the error and mistake. So it's a little, pro it's a little different than on, I think, uh, you know, just from a municipal side, you have the police. There's a different process within the schools, but there's a large majority of it is spelled out quite, um, in a quite detailed manner in our policies and the handbook. Anything else on reports? Dr. Doherty, before we go on to the um, evaluation, I think we should get you appointed to some. Yes, <laughs> yes. So I'll Please. take the motion <laughs> if you don't mind. <clears throat> Move to appoint the superintendent, John F. Doherty, to the re as the Reading Public Schools representative to the Board of Directors of the North Shore Education Consortium for the 2017 to 18 school year. Second. Anybody want to second? Second. Thank you. <laughs> yes. um, Dr. Doherty, you've been serving in this capacity for a little bit. I'm sorry, what? You've been serving in this capacity for a while? Uh, for eight years. Yep. And it's an <laughs> annual appointment, yeah? Any yes, questions? I am. Oh, Mr. Robinson. Yes. I'm not suggesting that you're not the right person here, but I'm just, is it, is it a, guideline of the committee that the, sup the district superintendent or can we according to the statute it either has to be the superintendent or a school committee member okay mm. I'm not interested <laughs> 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 any further questions or comments all right all those in favor six zero we got it <laughs> um, move to appoint this uh, Move to appoint Superintendent John F. Doherty as a Reading Public Schools representative of the Board of Directors of the SEAM Collaborative for the 2017-2018 school year. One second. 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 <laughs> Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Oh, well, sorry, Dr. Doxer. So it just, it just occurred to me. So the other... Um, the other people that are the representatives, the delegates, are they mostly superintendents? They're all superintendents. They're all superintendents. That answered my question. Thank you. All those in favor? Six zero. All right, our last agenda item for the evening is um, our annual evaluation process. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Doherty. And I'm going to try to streamline this a little bit. I right. appreciate it. Because <laughs> um, um, you, have, you have the slides, but I will do diligence as to the information. I know you will. We have seen the slides, um, and but the committee is very committed to a very timely process, yes. so also don't feel the need to rush. We do. It's an important work. Sure. So, um, so I did send to you this afternoon um, information that we presented the last time, which were the Word documents of the summative and the memo that was given to you last time, as well as the timeline. Um, so that the actual process act begins tonight, um, and I believe you have until the 22nd um, to submit a draft of the summative to myself and the chair um, so that uh, we can begin that process. And then Linda will be sending a, setting up one-on-one -on -one meetings after the 22nd that uh, we can review the uh, w I can review with each school committee member the the summative, and then if um, if the school committee member wants to make any changes, that would be done at that time. If not, then they would send that summative to back to myself and the chair, and then that would be the final document, um, which would then get compiled as part of um, the whole evaluation packet. And then there's a summary that's done. I believe is it going to be done by. Yes, I should have interjected. At the last school committee meeting, um, I, Mrs. Webb, I don't believe you were here, and I said that I was going to reach out to you to find out um, if you had the bandwidth to do this over the next few weeks and also offer to take it off your plate. I know um, you and Mr. Robinson have been spending an enormous amount of time on negotiations, and I didn't want work to fall too heavily. Um, so I did speak with Mrs. Webb, and she, um, I think, was comfortable yes. <laughs> with me doing it this year. So I will be the person compiling okay. all the information. Um, she did share that she's got a very thorough process she's followed, and she's going to um, share that with me. So yeah. there should be a good deal of consistency. Thank you. So the, the goal is to have um, the school committee um, conduct the final evaluation on the 19th, I believe it's the 19th of June, which is uh, the last meeting for this school year. Um, so that that's a real quick part of the process 
Um, I'm not going to go through each one of these slides because some of these you saw when we did the mid-year. I have updated them to reflect the changes that have happened. Um, but I will show you the Dropbox link. Um, I did send the Dropbox link this, this afternoon as well. Um, so I'm going to flip through. These you've already seen. This is the, the process that we've been using. Um, this is the goal. Um, and then under the goal, there are uh, the, the focus areas. Um, throughout the entire year, you have seen presentations um, and been given information for these different uh, focus areas. And so that uh, what you have in the Dropbox are pieces of evidence, I guess you could say, um, that reflect all of these focus areas. Um, we've gone through this before, the different colors and what they mean, and that's, that's very similar to the district improvement plan uh, update, which is in the, um, the Dropbox. And I, was it included in this one? No, it wasn't. It's in the Dropbox. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these because we have this is a, a lot of the part that we did last um, mid-year. But I do want to flip through and go to this part here. So uh, I've been working with uh, Courtney Fogarty, our data coach, um, to have some data available related to the district improvement plan. Um, and that is going to be available in late May. So all of this data will be available in late May, and I will uh, share it with the committee once it becomes available. So you can see that uh, the area and uh, the focus area that it's connected to. So we're going to be providing some Fontas and Pinnell data for you, which um, is the, the benchmark assessments, the AMC, some math assessments, um, office discipline referrals, which would be connected to the social emotional learning. Um, Students having access to higher level classes, uh, that's going to be um, under the achievement gap. SAT and AP scores, not for 2016 17, because we don't have that information yet. That'll be also given to you in late May. Uh, the tiered fidelity instrument, which measures, measures the SEL implementation at each of the schools and chronic absences. So that'll be available in late May. Um, in the fall, uh, we will have the SAT AP scores from 1617, um, the MCAS uh, for all levels, uh, the YRBS data. We did administer the YRBS this winter, uh, so remember that's every, every two years, and so that data will be available in the fall, um, and also the college acceptances um, when Linda Williams comes and does her uh, presentation. So all of that data will, will be available in the fall. And then with the goals, um, and remember this year, the goals that I had separate individual goals, um, and then we had the district improvement plan goals, and we separate them uh, on purpose. Uh, so there was a connection. The first one was closing the opportunity gap, and then the other one was communication. Um, and again, that information is in the district improvement plan piece and the superintendent's goal piece, which is in your Dropbox. And then the analysis piece, I went through mid-year, and a lot of it hasn't changed. Um, you know, unfortunately, this year, a, a big part of time was focused on um, the budget process. And, um, you know, that, that committed a lot of time and energy out of our central office piece, which really slowed down the progress that we wanted to make in the, the different action steps of our district improvement plan. And that's something that we discussed um, mid-year when we were, we were doing that work with you. Um, what I do want to point out to you is all of the school committee meetings where we did highlight parts of the district improvement plan um, and the goals. And you could see from this chart, this is uh, from July until January um, in the different presentations. All of, almost all of these presentations are in the Dropbox mm -hmm. um, for your for your review to go back and look at. And then from February until what's going to be happening for the rest of the year, um, there are a few more presentations coming up. There'll be a science presentation on the 22nd. Um, and Joshua Eaton will come back and do another school improvement plan update on the 5th. 
um, leading to the evaluation process on the 19th. So I think I also want to show you the Dropbox, and I'm going to get to that in a second. So a couple other things just um, so that you're aware of what I've been involved with outside of the school district, which I do believe is an important part of the role as a superintendent to continue to network um, uh, with other superintendents, with other leaders, school leaders, both and state leaders. Uh, I, I am the chair of the scene board of directors for this year, and I believe that I've been volunteered to do that again next year. <laughs> Um, I am the chair of the Mass uh, MASS Professional Development Committee, which plans the Summer Executive Institute. Uh, the invitation to the White House this year was a great honor that, that s some of us were a part of. Uh, I'm a member of the Superintendent's Advisory Committee uh, to the Commissioner of Education. We meet every six weeks with the Commissioner um, and talk about uh, current topics and our concerns from our different perspectives. Each of the roundtables, the Ma uh, the superintendent roundtables are represented from all over Massachusetts. So there are 12 of us that meet with this, the um, commissioner and his staff every six weeks to discuss issues. And then um, at MASS and MASC made presentations on social emotional learning this year. Um, I, I believe Mrs. Doxer was part of that at MASS, but we've also done it um, in, in other venues as well. The, other areas to note this year, other things that we were involved with that aren't necessarily goal-related, um, did transition four new administrators, including the Director of Finance, uh, the Birch Meadow Principal, the Killam Principal, the Parker Principal into the school district, um, the override, the FY18 budget, who could forget the copper and lead water testing that we went through in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, I already talked about the, the Josh Eaton, the Principal appointment, the RMH list litigation, um, and what's ongoing right now with negotiations. So there's been a lot of things that have been going on outside of the activities that have been happening in the district improvement plan. Um, the Rice Preschool, too. And the Rice Preschool, yes. Thank you. I forgot about that. Thank you. So that's pretty much where we're at. And I just want to point out the Dropbox if you haven't accessed it. So the, when you receive the link... You can get a Dropbox link here, and all of the documents that I was referring to earlier are, are here. Uh, most of them will look familiar to you. They're in school committee packets. I did include a couple of other things, um, including agendas from some of our district leadership team meetings um, and our central office leadership team meetings, uh, some of our newsletters, which um, you would have access to, which highlight some of the areas that we've focused on. Some other presentations that maybe necessarily we didn't do here, for example, we did a presentation on kindergarten for our kindergarten parents that are connected to some of the goals and action steps that we've been talking about. Um, and I did include some, some other things as well. All of these are pretty much connected to um, everything that we have been discussing throughout the year. Um, certainly there's other information that you need. I'll be more than happy to provided for you, but I think, I think that should give a pretty big picture of what's been going on in the district and how it connects to our district improvement plan and um, the superintendent's goals. It should give you information on completing the summative. It looks comprehensive. <laughs> Mr. Did, Robinson. Did that, the link to that Dropbox is not, I didn't get I it. I sent it this afternoon to you. Yeah, okay. Yep. Thank you for that. Sent. Any questions or concerns? Oh, yes, Barbara. Yeah, I know it's late, and I, I have three three comments, so I'll just go through them in order, but all of them require follow-up. We just won't do it all tonight. Um, so the first is the slide that you had, it's the green chart that says school committee presentations connected to goals. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you put that up? I just wanted to, I really like it. You really yeah. like it? Yeah, and I want to explain <laughs> why. Um, and how, and I just have a question about how we might take this approach in another direction relating to communication. So my first topic, question, whatever is, I, I like this approach of linking the priorities of the district 
to the resources already available on the website. So if people want to learn about a particular topic, they know exactly which packets to open, which are very you know, organized on the, on the site. And I'm wondering if there would be some way, and this isn't a question for tonight, but just to think about for future discussion, are there ways that we could identify what motivated the need for improvement in each of these areas and how these resources demonstrate action toward that? And, and w one thing I'm reacting to is there's, there's a lot of information in the Dropbox, and, and I'll, I'll go through is that information and the other stuff in the, in the packets that you've provided. But I'm wondering if we could take kind of, this is almost like a library approach where you, you, you reference the information that's already been prepared rather than creating a whole new document or a whole new slideshow. I'm wondering if there's a way on the website to communicate. So if parents are really interested in a particular topic or a particular aspect of the district improvement plan, they would have a chart like this on the website they could go to and say, you can read you know, these 10 different school committee packets and these are the primary documents that identified the need for improvement two, three years ago. So that was the first point. Can I, can I just clarify? Yeah. So this, this question and point is not actually related to the superintendent review. I mean, this yes, is. Yes, it is. He did a good asking, job. Okay, okay, but what you're asking though is, I mean, we have we have to process this data. Absolutely. What you're asking is something is to do more relative to the data it's that's there and linking it for parents in a different way. More communication. This is this is all. Yeah, it's taking taking a, a way of communicating that I see here, okay. and seeing if we could use that approach okay. to achieve other goals within the district improvement plan. So in other words, so that something we're doing in one area would also benefit another area. Okay. Okay. So that's point one. So identifying in what motivated the need for improvement and action plan and the resources that are available, school committee packets, et cetera, in this format, which I really like. Um, second separate point, just in the goals, one thing that I'm looking for here going forward, and I'm, I'm new to this, this process, uh, so I haven't been all the way through it yet, but what I noticed was a lot of process goals, not exclusively, but a lot of process goals. In other words, engage in a certain amount of activity um, around each of these focused areas. So have certain meetings, introduce concepts to teachers, students, et cetera. And I see less outcome data um, there is a page on data that you, you pointed to here, the achievement gap, literacy, math, SAT scores, et cetera. Again, I, I, I'm going to be looking as I go through these materials for what were the outcomes before this set of goals was established in 2016, and how have those outcomes changed in 2017, 18, and then going forward, right? So, under, so I'll be looking for that for each goal. What's the data that supports the need for improvement? And what's the data that demonstrates that that improvement was achieved? And it could be anything from a, you know, a state assessment to a MTSS, um, student attendance, uh, discipline referrals going down. It could be multidimensional, but that's that approach of here's a, here's a need, here's the data that shows that need, <coughs> here's the improvement that was achieved by the process. So where that's applicable, I'll be looking for that. And then lastly, just there was a comment here that I, I also liked your analysis section says principals and teachers will need to focus on one or two focus areas and do them well. And to me that I think is an even broader principle here that you, different principle, that, that can apply district wide that you know we have a lot of accounting in these slides of how many different, you have for instance early evidence of change progress where you have the different focus areas and the number of complete, uh, complete initiatives or activities. Um, I'd like to know what we're not going to do as a result of the other competing priorities that have stepped in in the last two years. So what, what were we planning to do that we're not going to do? That would be helpful to understand. So identifying when we refocus our efforts, what's being set aside and what's going to be the, the fewer things that we're going to do well. Just to, if I can take that last one. Dr. Doherty, I think you said you planned on doing that work over the summer with the administrative team, correct? On, on re looking at um, timelines. That, that is correct. So I, I think there is, that's in the works, the, the information you're looking for, which is what is not going to be done or what is going to be put off or what's going to take longer. But okay. right, but um, just so, but for right, you know, as we look at this process, um, I mean, I, 
what we see is there's a certain amount of things that got completed, some that are ongoing. You know, they're in different stages, right? And so those are the things, as we look at it for this evaluation, those are the things that are in process that maybe weren't completed that didn't get the um, achievement level or the completion level that we would have liked because of the other priorities. But this is taking it the next step into next year, saying, you know, com the competing priorities and, and how we're going to be more focused, recognizing that we have a really big competing priority next year around the override. I mean, that has, in, unless that becomes, actually we incorporate sort of, um, you know, building that into the goals, building that information and that evaluation and the work that will be required into the, specifically into the goals. Anything else? Yeah, just I, I agree. I, I just I don't think I fear there's too much going on mm -hmm. here. And there, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of you know, effort in multiple directions. It's very clear. And given some issues that have developed since this set of goals was put in place in I guess 2015. Oh, I think this year. No, the 2016, 7, 16 to 19 is the improvement plan. So th the the there are considerations that, you know, Eileen brought up one of them, that look different now than they did in 2015 when this three-year plan was well, we established. talking about an override then, too. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I just want to make sure that in an effort to do everything, you don't miss the opportunity to achieve something that we would otherwise achieve if we pared back our, our goals or our expectations, focused on the state level. Thank you. Anything else? Um, having done this a couple of times, I would advise everybody to get cracking on it soon. There's a lot of data to go through. It isn't just a matter of opening it up and starting to fill it out. There's a lot of data to go through and reading to do as you process the evaluation. So um, May 22nd may sound like a couple weeks away, and it is, but yeah, I suggest it, breaking it. I personally break it into little chunks and do a little bit every day or two because it's quite a – it's to do it right is quite time intensive. Um, so please have um, rough draft evaluations to me and Dr. Doherty by May 22nd. And, and as I mentioned earlier, this should all be a second review. You all, you for the yeah, most part, you've seen, seen all seen this seen at least once. That's a good, that before. is a very fair point. Yes, we did see this in a year. Um, at the back of our packet, there's some correspondence, and Dr. Doherty was kind enough to incorporate some budgets from SEAM and North Shore Education, just pointing yes. it out for everyone's education. I assume you've already reviewed it. Uh, anything else this evening? Oh, we went late, but we, we caught up quick. Thank you. Um, oh, I need to declare that at this point, an executive session is necessary to protect the bargaining position of the board. Move to enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and not return to open session. Is there a second? Dr. Nunn? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Robinson? Yeah. Dr. Doxer? Mrs. Redden? Yes. Mrs. Browski is yes. Good night. Good night.